please welcome your host, John Gossman, Lead Architect at Microsoft Azure. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Azure Open Dev. In this event, you'll learn best practices for using open source and Azure together. You'll hear from open source thought leaders at companies like Canonical, Chef, Docker, Pivotal, and Red Hat. And we also have speakers from Microsoft Teams who are both using and producing open source. These speakers will be demoing how to use Node and Java with Azure. And you'll show you how you might want to integrate open source DevOps tools into your Azure workflow. We also have sessions on how to use containers and container orchestrators, both to bring your maybe new microservices-based applications, as well as existing lift and shift applications into containers and onto Azure. But before we go to, into the agenda, I want to back up and give you a little bit about our vision for Azure and open source. You may be wondering, why does Microsoft love open source? And where are we going with it? So to set a little of that context, I want to tell you something about myself. I'm an architect in the Azure team. My focus is on developer tools and systems for Azure developers. And of course, this includes our Microsoft products, our SDKs, our CLIs, our portal, and our REST APIs. But it also includes increasingly open source tools from the companies and communities that we're going to be talking about today. My job is literally to work with the companies and communities behind these open source technologies to make sure that they work great on Azure. For example, one of the most important technologies for open source on Azure is Linux. And as a result, I work with both the Linux vendors like Canonical and Red Hat, and I also sit on the Linux Foundation board to make sure that the community and governance model for Linux is strong. This all means that I have a very interesting perspective on what's going on. I sit at the intersection of Microsoft with our partners, our customers, and the communities that are working on Azure. And I get to see how people's lives are changing as developers and, and users in the cloud. It's a very exciting place to be, and it's a lot of fun. I'm going to back up and say it's actually a very exciting time to be alive, if you think about it. We live in one of these times of incredible rapid technological change. In fact, I like to say we live in a world of science fiction. Think about all the things that just a few years ago you would have said were something you'd only see in a movie or read in a novel that you have now today. Things like self-driving cars and, of course, electric cars. And I saw in the news today that people are starting to talk about flying cars finally. And we have machine learning and artificial intelligence that are so good that we actually kind of take it for granted that we can talk to our phone and it will understand us and answer back. And we have private companies that are doing space exploration and building spacecraft. We even have space tourists. In fact, Mark Shuttleworth from Canonical, who will be here later talking, has visited the International Space Station. How cool is that? Well, in all these changes, developers' lives are changing very rapidly too. The cloud revolution is one of those times like the PC revolution or the web revolution or the smartphone revolution where everything seems to be changing at once and developers have to kind of raise their game to be learning the new technologies while still working with the existing technologies that they've been using for years. So you might have a mainstream application where there's a strong ecosystem around the technology you're using but you might be adding new features to that thing, and you might be moving to the cloud or, or adopting DevOps practices. Meanwhile, you also need to be looking at new and emerging technologies like containers and serverless, where the best practices haven't necessarily been written down or maybe aren't even known. So there's a lot of burden to learn new things and all the time. So one thing I do know about Microsoft is that we understand uh, developers. Microsoft is a company by, of, and for developers. If you think about it, we were founded by two famous developers, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, and they were building a product for developers, Microsoft Basic. And the company has followed up through that time with other innovative developer products like .NET 
or Visual Basic, Visual Studio. Developer productivity is actually at the core of the Microsoft DNA. And I've talked to a lot of developers at Microsoft. And one thing I've found is like the developers everywhere, Microsoft developers love open source. We love to be able to read the code, to get our hands on it, to be able to debug it, to interact with it in ways that we couldn't do with just proprietary code. In fact, open source, you really need to think about it as it's a way to scale a project beyond what can be done in any single organization, even a big organization with a lot of developers on staff like Microsoft. Open source allows us to collaborate with our customers, our partners, and even our competitors in a way that we couldn't do in other cases. You can, rather than simply report a bug, you can go in, find the line of code, and maybe even fix it, or certainly help isolate the thing, or implement a feature that you need or want uh, in that product. The key ingredient required that backs all this, is, though, is you need to have strong and diverse communities. Without strong, diverse communities, none of this is possible. So Microsoft has a basically a four-pronged approach to open source. First of all, we just need to make it work, right? So one of the things that we have to do is just enable these various open source projects, whether that be fixing it ourselves or helping the other partners and communities that are working on these uh, products. Secondly, where appropriate, we want to try and add value by offering these open source products as services. Perfect example of this is our recently announced MySQL and Postgres services, where developers can use the standard MySQL and Postgres interfaces that they're familiar with. It's not some strange fork, but by us providing it as a service, it takes the operational burden off the developers for using that product. Increasingly, we are also releasing Microsoft projects as open source. Famously, .NET, for example, is a great example of this. The reason we want to do this is because to get back into that collaboration cycle where I talked about, where we can now collaborate in new ways with our customers and our partners and literally scale these projects beyond the boundaries of what can be done just at Microsoft. And finally, we need to contribute to open source ecosystems. And this means both code contributions and it also means backing the big institutions and foundations that enable strong communities. For example, the Linux Foundation or the Apache Foundation or the Open Compute Project. The result of all of this is that today there are over 15,000 Microsoft employees with GitHub accounts so that they can work in different ways on these open source projects. But that's just a statistic. Let me tell you a couple specific stories. You probably have heard of Anders Heilsberg and know him as the creator of C Sharp programming language and before that Turbo Pascal. Well, Anders' latest project is TypeScript. TypeScript is a strongly typed superset of the JavaScript programming language. But it compiles down to standard JavaScript, which means it'll run anywhere that JavaScript runs, which basically means everywhere. And Anders has been doing this entire project on GitHub in the open. In fact, as you can see, he's the living contributor to the TypeScript project. So here we have a case of one of the most legendary language designers of all time and one of Microsoft's most senior and productive developers. And he's doing his project entirely in open source on GitHub. If you're not familiar with Visual Studio Code, I highly recommend you go check it out. Visual Studio Code is a lightweight editor and IDE. It runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and it's available for free download. Of course, Visual Studio Code supports Microsoft languages like C Sharp, F Sharp, and TypeScript. But it also is a great development platform for Node and Golang programming. In fact, recently I've talked to some startups in the Valley that are entirely Go shops, and yet their developers in the last year have switched almost entirely to using Visual Studio Code because they find it the most productive way to do Go language development. These are developers that actually 
don't use a lot of other Microsoft products. Well, Visual Studio Code is based on the open source Atom editor and is entirely available uh, on GitHub in an open source form. But we don't only contribute to Microsoft backed projects. I'm sure you've heard of Docker and we're going to hear from the Docker company later today. But you may be surprised to find out that John Howard from the Windows team is the leading contributor the last 12 months to Docker and the fourth leading contributor all time. There's so much open source going on in Microsoft now that it's actually pretty hard for me to keep track of. Certainly five years ago, I probably could have told you about all the major open source projects at Microsoft. Two years ago, I could have given you the basic landscape. Literally today, I find out about new open source work at Microsoft a couple times a week. I knew that LinkedIn had created Kafka and was its biggest user. But I was surprised to find out that Bing was one of the next two biggest users of Kafka and had been so for a couple of years. I found out about LightGBM from listening to a podcast, not a Microsoft podcast, just a machine learning podcast. And the, the speaker started talking about one of the latest things that showed up in the last year is this thing like GBM, and he said it came from Microsoft, and I had to go uh, look it up. So it's an exciting time to be a developer and to work in the cloud with open source. Microsoft is committed to using open source in our products and enabling open source for our customers and partners. And that's why we're here today for this event. So we got a whole lot of other things coming on the rest of the day. Next up, is Scott Johnson from Docker, who will talk about modernizing traditional applications and bringing hybrid applications to Azure. I hope you enjoy the day. Please welcome Scott Johnston. Chief Operating Officer at Docker. Good morning. Welcome to Azure Open Dev. We are so excited to be here this morning, and we're really looking forward to sharing with you in the next couple of minutes some really interesting ways in which Docker and Azure together can help you build, ship, and run hybrid applications. We're going to start with a brief overview of Docker. And from there, we'll segue into today's announcement, which is that we're bringing Docker Community Edition to the Azure Container Service. And then we'll do a brief demo of how you can use Docker for Windows and Docker Cloud to build, ship, and run a hybrid application, a hybrid Java Linux application to Docker Community Edition on Azure Container Service. We'll then share a second way in which you can bring hybrid apps to Azure through actually modernizing your existing traditional applications and using tools from both Docker and Azure to bring those to the hybrid cloud. Then we'll also demo how to use a tool provided by Docker, uh, given to the open source community, to modernize those applications, which we call Image to Docker. Sound good? If so, please welcome me in joining Michael Fries, Product Manager at Docker. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. I'll uh, just uh, briefly uh, talk about Docker and containers, and then I'll, I'll get to the demo. At Docker, we're building a containerization technology. Uh, and containers are a great way to take an app uh, or some other piece of software that you want to run and package it up into a standalone package that you can uh, share with your colleagues or uh, deploy it to test QA or, or in production. Um, so a lot of people compare containers to virtual machines, but they're actually a little bit different. So instead of virtualizing hardware with containers, only the operating system is virtualized. So that means if you're running three containers on the same system, they actually share the same operating system kernel. Um, but the processes are isolated and the file system um, is, is sandboxed so that each container runs in an isolated context and cannot impact other containers running on the system. So that means that um, containers are very lightweight. Uh, you don't ship around a full operating system um, with each container. Uh, they're also portable. Um, you can run them anywhere where Docker runs. Um, and they're secure because um, the container processes are isolated. And, and they're fast um, because um, uh, the operating system is shared, so uh, um, you don't have the full overhead of, of hardware virtualization. Um, 
So um, this is just to give you like an a overview of the Docker platform. Um, so uh, Docker runs on both uh, Windows and Linux. Um, we started out on Linux, and then thanks to the great partnership that we have with Microsoft, um, Docker was ported to, to Windows also and runs on Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016. You can deploy uh, Docker uh, on bare metal on-prem. Uh, you can deploy it in virtual machines if you want, or, or in the, cli uh, in the cloud, um, or any kind of hybrid scenario that you can imagine. On top of Docker, um, we have a bunch of great uh, content on Docker store, plugins, um, um, pre-made container images that you can start from. Um, and then um, developers and ops can take that and uh, containerize their apps and, and use it to ship um, apps and source code from uh, development through testing QA to, uh, to production. Um, Docker is part of a wider uh, container ecosystem. Um, so we work with more than 400, 450 partners um, that provide content and plugins on Docker Store. Uh, we also uh, make sure that Docker runs on a bunch of different, different operating systems and that uh, Docker works great on uh, um, all the infrastructure that you want to use uh, for running containers, including Microsoft Azure, of course. Uh, Docker is also part of uh, um, uh, this, this other uh, um, container vendors. So if for some reason you're not happy with Docker, there are alternatives. Docker is based on open standards, and we work uh, very actively with the CNCF and the OCI to make sure that uh, we're building on standard technology. Um, so, so you have choice. Um, Docker comes in two editions. Um, there's Docker Community Edition and Docker Enterprise Edition. Um, Docker Community Edition is based uh, almost purely on, on open source software, and we make it freely available to, uh, to developers and, and operators. Enterprise Edition is our um, uh, pro uh, product and subscription for, for enterprises that want to run containers in production. And it gives you a full container as a service platform uh, to manage your um, kind of software lifecycle. Um, it comes with enterprise support. Um, and we certify Docker Enterprise Edition on infrastructure, including Azure. And we also provide certified content from vendors on Docker Store, both plugins and container images. Um, OK, so on to, on to the announcement that we have for you today, which is that um, Docker and Microsoft are bringing Docker CE to the Azure Container Service. Um, so it used to be that there were a couple of different ways to run uh, Docker on Azure. Uh, we at Docker built something called Docker for Azure, and uh, Microsoft, the Azure team is, is uh, maintaining the Azure Container Service. Um, so what's uh, happening is that um, Docker Community Edition is now going to be available in as, and as part of the Azure Container Service. And it's the first step of uh, Microsoft and Docker trying to converge, uh, converge and settle on a good way to run uh, Docker on Azure. Um, so. Uh, what this is going to give you is a fully configured uh, Docker Swarm uh, running on, on Azure. And just to, to recap what Swarm is, it's, uh, it's Docker's native orchestration and clustering solution. It comes built in with Docker. Um, and it uh, comes with uh, built-in load balancing, uh, service discovery, and uh, overlay networking. Um, and it's secure by default. Uh, it has support for secrets um, and configuration management. Um, and it's scalable, especially on Azure. Um, yeah, um, so uh, with that, I'll move on to the, the demo. And the demo I'll show today is that I'm going to start from a um, Azure Container Service Swarm that I already pre-configured. Then I'm going to register that Swarm with uh, Docker Cloud using my Docker ID. Um, and then I'll take a application that I have on my laptop, uh, and I'll build and run it and deploy it on um, ACS Swarm. So let's move on to the, to the demo. Uh, so the demo I'll show is um, I already set up a uh, Docker Community T Edition Swarm on Azure Container Service. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll register that with Docker Cloud using my Docker ID. Um, and then I'm going to um, show you how uh, you can use uh, Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac to access that Swarm from your uh, development laptop or desktop, uh, and how you can then uh, build and deploy an app on, on Azure Container Service. Um, so, um, as you can see here, uh, I already uh, set up a couple of uh, swarms on, on Azure. Um, the one I'm going to be using right now is uh, this one, OpenDev2. 
Um, you can see this deployment, uh, and uh, there's a bunch of resources uh, associated with the swarm. So this is uh, all the stuff that's required to make Docker run on uh, ACS. Uh, so some storage and um, uh, a couple of swarm and, uh, master and worker uh, virtual machines. Um, so now I'm going to take the swarm that I already set up, and I'll register it with uh, Docker Cloud. So I'm already logged into Docker Cloud, and I'll click this Bring Your Own Swarm button. And then Docker Cloud is going to tell me to run a registration command. And that is going to prompt me for my Docker ID. Uh, so I'll just log in. Like so. And then I'll be prompted for a name, so I'll call it Frisum Azure Open Dev. Um, and what's going to happen now is that this swarm will be registered with uh, Docker Cloud and uh, tied to my Docker ID. Uh, so if we go back to Docker Cloud, I can refresh, and you can see I now have um, an Azure Open Dev uh, swarm registered uh, on Docker Cloud. The best part, though, is that I can now uh, access this swarm very easily um, from my laptop using um, uh, Docker for Windows. Um, so I already have uh, Docker for Windows running here. You can see the whale icon in my system tray. Um, so I'll right click on that. And um, you can see I have a couple of swarms. Uh, I'll just zoom in. Um, so these are the swarms that I have uh, registered with um, Docker Cloud uh, that I can use from, from my laptop. So I'll just click the one I just created. Uh, and I now have a, um, a console that's uh, hooked up to that swarm. So I can do Docker PS to see what's running. I can list the nodes. So you can see this is a, a four-node uh, four node swarm with uh, one master node and three, uh, three worker nodes. Uh, just to see, show you how easy it is. Uh, once more, um, I right click, and then I can um, list the swarms and uh, access it real easy. And the, the neat part is that I can uh, share access to this swarm uh, with my colleagues or anyone else uh, that have a Docker ID, and they don't have to mess around with the SSH keys or anything else, um, as long as they have a Docker ID. So um, that uh, covers setting up uh, the swarm on ACS and registering it with Docker Cloud. So now I'll actually try to do something useful and deploy, deploy an app that I have on my laptop. Uh, so this is a... It's an app called Etsy. It's uh, like a web shop that we use for demo purposes. It's a Linux, Java-based uh, uh, microservices app. Um, and it's already been uh, Dockerized. If you want to try it out, you can um, uh, clone it from, from GitHub. Um, so it's, um, it's um, got four services, basically. So, and it's already been Docker Dockerized. So you can take a look at the Docker Compose file. Um, this is the file that. Um, specifies how each of those four different components are built and how they're supposed to be networked together so that the whole app uh, functions correctly. Um, uh, so I can use that uh, compose file to, to build the app with Docker Compose. So I'll do that right now. Um, and I actually cheated a little bit. So I already built the app on, on my swarm, so the images are cached, so this, uh, this build is really fast. Um, so that completed now. Um, and I can show you the images. Um, so there's a bunch of images in this swarm, including the ones I just built for the, for the ADC app. It's these ones. Uh, great. So uh, now, I, now I built the images, and I can push those to Docker Hub. Um, so I'll do that with Docker Compose also. So I'll use the push command. And that's going to take the images that are currently just on the Swarm on Azure and uh, push them to Docker Hub. Um, and it's also pretty quick. Um, all right. Um, so now that the images are pushed to a registry, I can um, deploy the whole app on, on ACS. And I do that with the Docker stack command, Docker stack deploy. Uh, use the compose file again. Now I have to give it a name, so I'll just call it Etsy. Um, and so Docker's now going to look at that compose file, and for each service, it'll create a corresponding service on um, Swarm um, and network it all together so that the app works. So I'll go back to the Azure portal and find the uh, endpoint where the app will be running. And it's this one. And I know it's going to be running on port 8080. So I'll just open that up. 
and hopefully we'll see the Etsy uh, web shop running on Azure. Yep, there we go. Um, so all, all the four uh, services that go into powering this app are now, are now running. Um, yeah, so just to, uh, to recap, um, what, what I did was I took a, um, a Azure Container Service um, Community Edition, which is in preview. You can go deploy it uh, from GitHub or using the ACS Engine tool. Then I registered it with um, Docker Cloud using my Docker ID. Uh, then I accessed it from uh, Docker for Windows um, because I was already logged in. That was uh, very simple. And then I built and deployed the app on, on ACS in a couple of minutes, um, uh, thanks to Docker and, and Azure. So that's it. And I'll uh, invite Scott back on stage to take Thank you, Michael. That was a really exciting use case for Docker and Azure and a really compelling demo. We'd like to share with you a second use case for Docker and Azure, and that is how to bring hybrid apps to the cloud, but starting with your existing traditional applications and modernizing those using tools from Docker and Azure to bring them to the hybrid cloud. Now, as context, uh, microservices are obviously a very exciting application pattern, a very exciting new application pattern. And in fact, Docker is often discussed simultaneously with microservices. And, and of course, the reason is that the the Docker container as a unit of application deployment is very, very uh, sensical, if you will, to developers and operators. Developers build what's inside the container and operations folks are responsible for deploying and managing the outside of the container and deploying it into production. And of course, the media has been quite excited about the rise of this new application pattern and the analysts have weighed in with how it's going to help really revolutionize our software supply chain. And you've seen the rise of microservices uh, basically parallel the rise of Docker. Uh, however, if you look at an organization and across their entire IT uh, organization, you see that more than 80% of their applications are actually residing on existing systems that were pre-microservices and pre-containers. Um, moreover, if you look at it from another cut, if you just look at the spend of those organizations, most of their spend, 75% of their spend, is actually on existing traditional applications. And so it begs the question, what about, what about them? What about the, those owners and operators responsible for those traditional apps as well as the apps themselves? Well, as we've been working on this with Microsoft and our customers, we've discovered that customers really are interested in an evolutionary approach to microservices. Instead of taking an overnight, very abrupt step and blowing up their applications, instead, they are more likely to start with an existing app containerize that app. That gives the app a lot of exciting properties, which we'll talk about in a second. And then over time, factor out the common services that can be put into a container and made available to other applications. And so really what we're seeing is the journey to microservices is a step-by-step -step evolutionary approach, uh, not a one and done uh, abrupt approach. And so it begs the question, why, why bother? Uh, why not just let those legacy applications sunset, retire, move on to net new uh, greenfield microservices apps. Well, what we're found is that if you take an existing application and containerize it and put it into that container and put it on modern infrastructure such as Azure, that you get some wonderful properties that the 10-year-old the app even didn't even see before. Properties like much more portable between developer desktops, between developer and operations, between the data center and Azure public cloud. It's actually much more secure. The same application code is more secure being inside the container because it gets the benefits of isolation from the container uh, isolation units that Mike dis Michael discussed earlier. It is um, much more efficient in that it uses approximately half the infrastructure that it did when it was on-prem. Um, and the portability means that you can actually move faster through your software developer lifecycle. So we're actually seeing improved agility from uh, existing legacy apps that have been containerized and, mo and modernized. Really important, so once you modernize the app, how do you manage its life cycle? Well, we're very excited to offer a Docker Enterprise Edition, which is our container as a service product, a commercial product that is built on open source standards and technologies. And what it allows developers and operators to do is to together work on modernizing the apps, put it into a container, and move that container through the application development life cycle. Uh, and what's important is that this platform, the container as a service platform offered by Docker, isn't just for uh, legacy traditional applications. It's also for microservices. It's also for third-party 
ISV applications, and anything in between. Basically, if it's inside a container, it can be managed by the Docker Enterprise Edition Containers as a Service platform. And so that flexibility for developers and operators that you have a single set of tools, regardless of the type of application, uh, we found that customers are very excited about. So to help customers take this very first step on this multi-step journey toward microservices, we partnered tightly with Avanade and Microsoft to develop what we call the Modernized Traditional Apps POC program. This is a very exciting program that in five days will take an existing legacy application, modernize it, put it into a container, and put it on modern infrastructure on Azure, and put it under the management of Docker Enterprise Edition. And what we've seen from the uh, results of this program, which we've been uh, in private trial since December, uh, several, several dozen customers have been through it, um, are pretty dramatic. We have a couple of public references. They appeared at DockerCon. We're really happy to share them again with you here this morning. Um, first up is Northern Trust. Northern Trust is a large financial services firm. They had an existing legacy app built on Java Linux stack technologies. And by going through this program, the MTA POC program with Avanade and Microsoft and Docker, they were able to reduce their deployment time by 75%. They went from 29 days, 29 days to make a deployment to seven days. On top of that, they found that they were doubling their infrastructure efficiency. They required half the infrastructure to accomplish the same performance of the application. Uh, and not, not the least of which, they are now able to put it on modern infrastructure, put it on Azure, and take advantage of Azure's elasticity benefits as well. Another public uh, use case, another public reference is Microsoft's own IT organization. Um, this is a .NET Windows application that was built on uh, Windows Server 2003. And we were able to, again, within five days, come in and modernize 10 applications, containerize those applications, put them on Azure under Docker Enterprise Edition Management. And you can see the, the pretty stunning benefits here. We were able to maintain the performance, maintain the scalability, while increasing the app density by 4x and reducing the infrastructure cost by a third. So obviously, really exciting results. You get higher performance with less cost. And who wouldn't be excited by that? What well, we've seen a lot of customers be excited about it. They, they um, are asking for tools to help them get started on this, on this journey. And Docker is really excited to offer an open source tool called Image to Docker, which helps customers automate the discovery and modernization of their application. So I'm going to turn it back to Michael, and he's going to walk through this very exciting open source tool for you. Michael? Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, Scott mentioned uh, we're uh, with the Docker community. We're building a couple of tools uh, that we call Image to Docker. Uh, we have two variants. There's a variant for Linux and one for Windows. And uh, what they do is, um, as Scott mentioned, um, sometimes you may have a traditional app where uh, it's running well on a server somewhere on a on a VM, uh, but you might have lost track of where the source code is or the developer that built the app originally is not around anymore. Uh, and we want to help um, uh, users and enterprises that want to containerize uh, traditional apps like that. Um, so what the image to Docker tools do is that you can take a, um, uh, a virtual machine image that you exported from a production system uh, or a backup that you took, and then um, image to Docker will uh, inspect those um, uh, VM images for uh, application artifacts that can then be containerized. Um, so um, what they do is basically uh, in inspect the VM image, and then um, we have a pluggable architecture for what we call detectives. Uh, so um, there's a detective for MySQL, for example, and one for uh, .NET, IIS, uh, on Windows, and so on. And then um, for all the components that are found in the virtual machine image, uh, corresponding uh, sections in a Docker file are created. Um, so they're a great way to get, to get started with um, migrating traditional apps into containers. Um, so if you're interested in these tools, uh, you can find them on GitHub. Um, they're in the Docker organization. Uh, and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna demo the Linux variant uh, right now. Um, so on this system, um, I already have a VMDK image um, ready. And so I happen to know that this uh, virtual machine image contains a LAMP style app. So it's got um, it's Linux and Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Um, and then I also have the uh, image to Docker tool here. So I can run that. Um, so I'll bas I basically just um, um, run, well, I'm just going to create a directory actually. Um, um, so I'll basically just run the image to Docker tool and point it at the VMDK image that uh, I have on this system. 
Uh, and what that, that's going to do is going to spin up all the um, detective containers that are going to go inspect the uh, inspect the, um, um, virtual machine image. Um, and we can take a look at the output here. Um, so it'll output a Docker file and then um, uh, the other um, artifacts that were exported from the image. So we can just take a look at this Docker file. Um, that's not very easy to see, but it figured out all the packages that were installed in the in the virtual machine, and then it also uh, extracted the different detectives extracted sections for the Docker file. So there's some Apache stuff, and some MySQL stuff, and so on. Uh, back to you, Scott. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. So we think that's a pretty exciting demo of how. Docker and Microsoft together can breathe new life into existing traditional applications. And in a couple of short minutes, we've shown you how you can take an evolutionary stepwise approach to microservices, and that modernization actually gives you real benefits. It can give you benefits of portability. It can improve the security of 10-year-old applications, and it can reduce your costs in terms of both infrastructure as well as people dramatically. Uh, we're very proud to have a program with Avanade and Microsoft very, we're very proud to have a partnership with Avanade and Microsoft to help customers get started on this journey. We call it the Modernized Traditional Apps POC program. That includes Avanade Services, Docker Enterprise Edition uh, product, and Azure Services. And finally, we showed how the Docker Enterprise Edition, a commercial product built on open source standards and technology, can help developers and sysadmins manage. We've shown how Docker Enterprise Edition, a commercial product built on open source standards and technologies, can help developers and IT pros manage the application lifecycle from the developer desktop all the way into the cloud. So thank you for your time this morning. If you'd like to learn more, here are some links. And again, we've shown two really compelling ways how Docker and Microsoft can help users build, ship, and run hybrid applications to Azure. You can go to the links to try out Docker Community Edition for uh, the Azure Container Service. You can see the Image to Docker tool up in GitHub, and we welcome contributions. Um, and you can also go to the MTA link there and get more information, including links to demos and hands-on labs. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you online. Welcome, Mark Shuttleworth, founder of Ubuntu and Canonical. Right, hello everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not sure what time zones you're all in, but I assume it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. You'll be all over the world. Uh, today I want to dig in a little bit to the experience of DevOps with containers on Azure on Ubuntu. Uh, and so that's a fairly broad topic. Uh, I'll start out with, with a sort of high-level overview and then zoom in to some demos. Uh, everything that I'll do here is stuff that you can repeat trivially yourself. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bunch of URLs and pointers as to where you can find more information. Um, so I'm the founder of Ubuntu and Canonical. And really, our job here is to make sure that uh, as a guest, Ubuntu gives you access to everything that Azure delivers uh, with, with the best possible performance. Uh, and I'm delighted to say over the last 18 months or so, we've seen uh, just tremendous collaboration between the Ubuntu team and the Azure team uh, in, the, in the infrastructure, in the hypervisor, in the kernel. Uh, and you see the benefit of that in uh, much better networking and storage performance, much better throughput and access to all of the latest bits uh, on Azure. So that's what we're building on. That's the sort of substrate that we're building on. But the piece that you'll be interested in is your applications. Um, and so uh, today I want to focus in on a slightly different picture than this, uh, which is the idea that you might put a container system uh, uh, across a bunch of VMs and then deploy your applications uh, on top of that container system. The apps that I'll be um, uh, showing you are our example workflows around TensorFlow, which is an AI, a machine learning construct. Uh, and for people on the, on the cryptocurrency side, 
Ethereum, which is a kind of blockchain. I'll be doing some Ethereum mining, uh, all on top of uh, Azure and all stuff that you can easily uh, reproduce at home. Um, so container systems, there are, of course, a bunch of them. They're all good. Uh, Docker um, uh, is here on the show. And Docker, of course, runs really well on top of Ubuntu, on top of uh, Azure. Mesos, which I think comes from Twitter, and now Apache Mesos, uh, is also a great container system. But the one I'm going to be demoing today is uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and so uh, digging into that, what is Kubernetes? Well, it's a collection of services uh, that we weave together and then scale out effectively on VMs uh, on, on Azure. So that's what we're going to be building. That is the sort of base construct of Kubernetes. Uh, and I want to start out by the, you know, with the simplest possible um, uh, Kubernetes and the simplest possible uh, deployment capability or, or deployment approach uh, to, to Kubernetes, which is something called ConjureUp. So ConjureUp really speaks to the new class of software where we have lots of different components that have to come together. And those are often spread across many different VMs, right? So if you think of what Azure means to you, Azure is this tremendous uh, uh, repository of capacity, right? You can tap just an enormous amount of capacity on demand. Um, and uh, the, the real bottleneck on you is how fast you can integrate all the pieces that you need into um, something that is coherent, right? There's not much point in getting large numbers of VMs uh, that are sitting idle while you figure out what to do with them, right? You, what, what you really want is the ability to harness that compute uh, or that storage of that network uh, and do something useful with it as quickly as possible. So that's really what ConjureUp speaks to. Uh, super easy to install on, uh, on Linux, just snap install it. Uh, there's a brew install option if you're on Mac OS as well. Uh, and when you run ConjureUp, you're going to type just this one command, ConjureUp Kubernetes, which gives you um, essentially just a wizard that will walk through uh, a couple of different Kubernetes configuration options. Uh, so there are two high-level topologies. One is the uh, sort of Kubernetes core. That is aimed at developers. So it's really as small as possible. You can run it on your laptop if you want. Uh, that exact same thing runs on Azure. Um, and it, it really gives you a, an efficient target for dev and test. Um, uh, so you're using the, the minimal number of resources just to essentially bootstrap and test things out, figure out um, what you want to do. The canonical distribution takes that same topology and scales it out for resilience, for higher availability, uh, making it really easy effectively to build a, an HA cluster and then scale that out for larger production deployments. Um, so that tool actually looks like I'm going to switch, switch to that here. It walks you through a set of choices. Uh, it, it asks you essentially where you want to control that from. Uh, I set up a controller previously. And then you'll get to a screen like this, which essentially allows you to architect that deployment. So here I can go through the different components, and I can configure them. Or I might change the way I want to spread them across uh, a set of machines. So you can see here a screen that allows me to place different um, components of that, uh, of that topology uh, on different VMs. So this gives me a lot of flexibility with whether I want to, um, uh, with, with how distributed essentially I want the, the pieces of this deployment of Kubernetes to be. Um, it allows me to scale out individual components or shrink them back. I can put them on larger or smaller VMs. But simplistically, um, I, well, I can also go and change the configuration of elements. But simplistically, you just want to essentially run through all of that and then deploy them. And so this is then going to go off to Azure um, uh, and request all of the resources that are needed to build that Kubernetes, uh, the, the number of VMs. Then it's going to deploy all of the applications in those VMs and connect and configure them all so that they're aware of each other in a dynamic way. Um, in the uh, fine tradition of cooking demonstrations, um, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so I have uh, a set of controllers. And in this controller over here, This is a scaled out uh, Kubernetes, which I hope you can read. 
So that's, that's the, the sort of underlying view of the Kubernetes controller once it's all sort of built out. Um, that one's a slightly special one. I'll, I'll come back to it uh, in, a, in a sec. Okay, so um, Conjure Up will give you a sort of vanilla Kubernetes. All of the compute there will be standard compute. Um, the the um, container processes that you run will have access to standard x86 VM capabilities. Um, but it would be more interesting if we could do something using some of the newer capabilities of Azure. So um, for the next step in the demo, I'm going to dig a little bit under the hood uh, and uh, show you how to spin up that same kind of topology, but using GPGPUs. And so GPGPUs give you access to um, uh, much faster parallel compute for number crunching type workloads. And that's where things like blockchain or um, uh, TensorFlow machine learning would be, would be super interesting. So um, let's, let's do that again, essentially. Let's deploy Kubernetes again. But this time, we're going to, I'm going to go under the hood a little bit and show you the underlying steps in order to do it with GPGPUs. Now, to do this, you have to, you have to do a couple of things in preparation. First, uh, you need to um, go to your quotas, uh, and you'll need to specifically use the, I think, the South Central US and the US East regions on Azure, because those, I think, are the two that have GPGPUs. Uh, and you'll need to look um, specifically for uh, a quota element for NC type machines. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of the number of cores that you have access to there, divide by six. Each machine that you ask for is going to take six cores. I think the default quota is 12. Um, you will probably want at least 18 cores if you want to follow along this demo, and that'll give you three VMs with GPGPUs that you could, you could run um, TensorFlow or blockchain type works, workloads on um, very, very efficiently. So just go through the usual process to request additional quota on, uh, on those NC type machines and make sure that you do this on South Central US or US East. Um, uh, let me dig in. So here's what you're going to do. Um, I'm using a controller that I've already established, and it's a special controller. So it lets me um, uh, build models. Oh, hold on a second. Let me just switch. I'm just going to switch to a controller, which will let me create a new model. Uh, So it's pretty simple. Right, so I'm just getting a catalog of the models that I have, and we should see a new model, GPGPU demo, that's on South Central US. Uh, and so now I'm going to um, deploy uh, the Kubernetes worker charm. So we're using the model-driven operation system Juju, which is what's under the hood of Conjure Up. And I'm going to deploy the Kubernetes worker charm, but I'm going to add a specific constraint to use the standard N6 uh, instance types. Those are the instance types that have the GPGPUs. Um, and if I fire that off, that is going to essentially just create the first part of the whole topology. And it will make sure that those ones have the GPU, GPU machines. So as soon as that's up, I can go and show the model. And here you can see there will be three of those workers. Um, uh, and they've been mapped to three independent VMs. And those will be on the N6 uh, machine types. I'm now going to deploy the rest of the um, canonical Kubernetes uh, um, model. And what this does is it pulls in all of those other applications and allocates VMs to them. But it will see that I already have Kubernetes workers. It won't, it won't overwrite those. Effectively, it'll use the ones that I've got, which are the ones with GPUs. And the, the, the way Juju works, the charms, which encode the operations for each of these uh, applications, will detect that there is a GPGPU there. And we'll configure Kubernetes worker. We'll tag that node effectively 
appropriately so that later I can deploy workloads onto those nodes uh, that depend on having the GP GPUs. So if I come back to this picture here, uh, and apologies for the eye chart, but it, it becomes quite a big model. We're starting to use quite a lot of uh, GP GPUs or, or, or VMs. You can see what's going on here. I've got a Kubernetes master, um, which is not HA. I've just got a single one of those. And then I've got two clusters of Kubernetes workers, one which I deployed uh, uh, to standard compute-centric machines, and one which I deployed to uh, machines with the GP GPUs. So all of that's woven together in this model. Uh, and if I, um, I'm going to zoom out a, a bit so you can see this. If I, if I show the cluster info on that, you can see, um, uh, maybe zoom that back a little bit, then it's easy to read. Uh, you can see that that cluster is up and running. If I wanted to check the dashboard for that, that's what's, that's what's running over here. So this is the Kubernetes um, with both uh, GP, GPU and compute-centric um, nodes running. And here's an overview. So the, here are the different machines effectively uh, in that uh, cluster. Let me just check that I'm in the right place. I can show you. I can show you here, here are the machines effectively in the model. Here is the Kubernetes view of those same machines. And you can see that they've been tagged, some with CUDA, some without CUDA, some with GPU true, some without GPU true. All of that underlying work has been handled for you by the model-driven operation system. So you don't have to worry about all of that, right? What you can focus on is your deployments. Uh, and here you can see the things that have been deployed on top of that. Uh, we have a TensorFlow. Uh, we use Helm to deploy uh, these applications on top of Kubernetes. Uh, we have the TensorBoard. Uh, uh, and we have um, uh, a Bitcoin mining, uh, or sorry, Ethereum uh, mining application as well. So this is TensorBoard, which is kind of a dashboard for the um, underlying Kubernetes workloads, uh, or sorry, for the, for the AI uh, machine learning uh, construct. Uh, and there are two cool things to, sh to show you here. One is a picture of the, um, this is a self-iterating kind of evolutionary model, right? It's getting smarter and smarter and smarter off the same data set. And here you can see the curve of, uh, of that um, uh, introspection effectively of the, the model. Uh, and then there's a, an even cooler visualization um, of uh, the various kind of connectivity points or weightings in the graph um, that are being established, but that'll that'll take a minute or two to uh, to render. Um, let me come over to the um, Ethereum Bitcoin mining. This is a view, a real time view of um, the pace of uh, uh, the Ethereum Bitcoin mining. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure what last seen good never means, um, but I like the idea of a low hash rate, although maybe I shouldn't. So. Um, that's Kubernetes, uh, standing up Kubernetes in a nutshell. Two ways to do it. The easy way, which will just give you a vanilla one, and then the, 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 the deeper way, effectively, which will give you more control over what you, what you want to um, uh, deploy. There are a couple of things that I did to that model um, post-deployment that you should know about. First, there's a way to connect uh, Kubernetes up to Azure file storage so that you're using the native um, Azure file system for your storage uh, in the model. Um, uh, I told you about using Helm charts for the TensorFlow deployment and for the um, uh, Bitcoin deployment. Uh, and again, you can you can attach deployments that you do to particular um, uh, to particular nodes using uh, the node information. So if I if I just show you that briefly, um, here you can see. Again, an underlying Kubernetes view of the different pods uh, um, that have been deployed. And there's a similar um, uh, command, which will give me a view of all the different nodes and the tags associated with them. So I use those tags effectively to make sure that the workloads ended up um, in, with or without a GP, GPU, depending on um, uh, uh, the nature of the workload effectively. Um, uh, so 
just one last thing. Once you've got that Kubernetes up, you'll probably want to wrap a bunch of other things around it um, for better monitoring or log analysis or handling. And that's very easy to do. So I can deploy over an existing model. I can deploy uh, another, essentially another template. And what it'll let it do is enhance the existing model. So here is one um, which adds the, the ELK stack effectively uh, to the existing model. So if you deploy canonical Kubernetes elastic on top of the canonical Kubernetes model, you'll go and get some additional uh, uh, applications, which are um, uh, in the picture over here, uh, the pieces at the bottom. So that's file beats, top beats, and other aspects of the, of the ELK stack, essentially. So that gives you deeper analytics on exactly what's going on inside those VMs and can be quite useful. Um, uh, so one last point, uh, tutorials.ubuntu.com. If you go to tutorials.ubuntu.com and search for Kubernetes, you will find tutorials that will walk you step by step uh, through everything that I've done here today. Um, that's a super useful resource. Um, looks like looks like this, uh, and. Here's the getting started guide effectively that will walk you through this process step by step uh, if you want to reproduce uh, everything that I've done at home. There are also a bunch of good blogs online. It's not hard to find. And all of this is documented upstream at kubernetes.io too. Uh, when you do it this way, you're taking advantage of everything that we do to make sure that the underlying components are super fast uh, and that they can exploit uh, everything in in uh, Azure. There is a bunch of work happening right now to integrate um, capabilities of Kubernetes, such as load balancing and so on, with the Azure native services. So that's all happening upstream. And then we reflect it into the charms um, uh, so that you can take advantage of it very, very easily um, through this simple uh, standard interface. Right, so that's everything I had for you today. Uh, you, I, I would encourage you to um, do that uh, from the privacy of your own Azure credentials uh, and uh, um, look forward to seeing you in the online community around DevOps, Kubernetes, and Azure. Thank you very much. Please welcome back John Gossman. Wow, that was a great session. I hope you're all enjoying the show so far. Now, earlier this month in California, we announced that Microsoft is joining the Cloud Foundry Foundation. In my keynote, I talked about how ecosystem is such an important part of our approach to open source in the cloud. So now I'd like to introduce you to a special guest to talk a little bit more about the role community governance has in open source. Abby Kearns is the executive director of the Cloud Foundry Foundation, and she has agreed to answer us a few questions remotely. Abby, welcome to OpenDev. Thank you, I'm so excited to be here. You lead the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Foundry's charter? Yeah, absolutely. So the Cloud Foundry Foundation is chartered with holding and maintaining the IP for Cloud Foundry. But more than that, and I'd say the most important piece is fostering a sustainable ecosystem and community around Cloud Foundry. So keeping that community engaged and ensuring the continuity of Cloud Foundry for a very long time. And what does this mean for the enterprise? What role does the foundation play for customers looking at the cloud for their open source workloads? Well, for developers today, what we found in our research is that developers get excited when they are able to participate in open source projects within their work. And as many of these companies are transforming and becoming very software centric, there's an opportunity there for the companies and organizations to participate as never before in the upstream project and direction of technology, while also allowing their development teams to participate more and be more active in open source projects and open source communities. There's a tremendous amount of collaboration and innovation that can occur when all of these companies lean in to participate in open source. We're excited to be part of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Last year, Microsoft also joined the Linux Foundation. 
Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between these multiple foundations and communities and their role for the governance of open source? Yeah, absolutely. So a um, small known fact is Cloud Foundry Foundation is a collaborative project underneath the Linux Foundation. So we spend quite a bit of time working and collaborating with the Linux Foundation, but also with the other projects that reside underneath the Linux Foundation. Projects like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the Open Container Initiative, or the Node Foundation. We work closely with these other projects, sharing ideas and best practices, but also continuing to collaborate across our communities. Now, in addition to Cloud Foundry, there are some other projects that are part of the foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about the service broker work? Absolutely. So last year, we undertook an effort to look at the Cloud Foundry Service Broker API, which is how services are attached and bound to applications on the platform, and looked at opening that up to other projects and communities. That project and that conversation turned into what is now known as the Open Service Broker API. And that extends the Cloud Foundry Service Broker across other projects and communities like Kubernetes. So we've worked closely with the Kubernetes community as well as CNCF to continue to invest in that and build that out. So started small with Google and Pivotal and grew into IBM and Fujitsu and Red Hat and many others that really contributed to make that a, an amazing technology and continue to innovate on that to this very day. Thanks for that explanation, Abby. Finally, can you tell us what the ecosystem's reception is of cloud vendors like Microsoft joining this governance forum? Well, I am super excited about Microsoft joining the Cloud Foundry Foundation. I think Microsoft has been a participant in the community for some time, um, establishing and building the CPI for Cloud Foundry on Azure, and continues to be an active part of our community. So I'm really enthusiastic to have Microsoft participating in the Cloud Foundry Foundation. And I think there's a tremendous amount of potential as we think about users that are running their application workloads on Cloud Foundry and looking to public clouds. There's an opportunity to run on, on Azure on top of Cloud Foundry. And I think there's an opportunity to continue to grow and build that out with the service broker work, the work with Bosch, and as well as the extensibility into Azure. Thank you for so much for talking to us, Abby. Thank you. Have a great time. OK, and with that, now back to the show. Please welcome Joshua McKenty, Head of Global Ecosystem Engineering at Pivotal. Thank you, really happy to be here. Um, I, uh, I put this talk together as a bit of a mixtape, which um, you know, Bell and Sebastian have helped to organize the All Tomorrow's Parties events. And I was a child in the 80s. And I love this feeling that you get where you listen to all these different songs on a mixtape and you don't really understand how they're related to each other, but you get to the end and you kind of know what the story was about. Um, and sometimes I feel that way about Cloud Foundry, like it is the mixtape of cloud native software. And certainly our journey at Pivotal, working with uh, large enterprises has been a bit like that. They know when they start the tape that they're going on some kind of ride uh, and they're not really sure where they're going to get to, but they kind of commit themselves to that process. So I'm really excited to be uh, at uh, OpenDev today. And really, I wanted to talk about something that happened recently that was a pretty big moment in, uh, in the cloud native community, really, which is that uh, Microsoft joined the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, and we've been involved, obviously, with Cloud Foundry since the very beginning at Pivotal, uh, since we're a spin out of VMware where it was born. Um, but Microsoft getting involved uh, really is taking our relationship with them and our partnership with them to the next level. So I thought I would cover sort of how we think about openness at Pivotal and how we think about openness in our partnership with Microsoft. Um, and the idea of open uh, with security, right? So open is often conflated with just, well, anyone can do whatever they want, or we're all sort of socialists, and I'm Canadian, and... You know, this can go wrong in all these different ways. Uh, but what does open mean when, when it's a positive thing uh, without getting uh, overly permissive? So in software, and particularly in IT, 
I think of open in terms of uh, sort of three axes, right? What language am I allowed to use? As an enterprise developer, historically we were told, hey, you shall write in Java, or you shall write in .NET, uh, or you shall write in COBOL, and that's all you get. Uh, and only having COBOL at your disposal is really limiting. Uh, and so a lot of what's happened in the last 10 years, but really particularly in the last five, has been around this move towards polyglot of, of the openness of languages. Uh, we can write now in Python or in Node.js or in Go or in a mix of Java and .NET and have those applications not really care, have the application architecture elevated above the language choice. And that's really important. Uh, the second idea of openness is really where does my app run? Um, I want to be able to run it on my laptop when I'm working on it. I want to be able to run it in a dev environment dedicated maybe to my team or my line of business. And I want to be able to run it uh, in the public cloud of my choice, as well as in production data centers, possibly all over the world. So having freedom to run my application uh, in different locations, regardless of where I built it, is really an important separation. And this, this last sense of openness is what services can I use? And again, uh, you know, traditional and uh, large enterprise were pinned to maybe a single database or a single queue system. You know, thou shalt use the rack of databases in the, in the basement. Um, <laughs> thou shalt use the mainframe and the services that go along with it. Uh, and we've really grown beyond that now to say, hey, uh, I want flavors of SQL and flavors of NoSQL. I want queue services. I want in-memory cache, and maybe it's Redis today and Gemfire tomorrow and Mongo and Cassandra and whatever service I want. I want to be able to bring my application to those services without thinking about, hey, if I'm running it in this place, what services do I have available to me? Decouple those things. So there's a challenge with this much openness, which is uh, you can get lost in the details. You say, well, I sort of thought that SQL would work this way, and it did, except then I went to this other database, and those SQL functions didn't work. Or I was using this queue, uh, and then I switched, and I was using the same technology. Why is it when I was using Redis on my laptop, it worked? And then when I started using Redis off in the cloud, it failed. Right? So this principle, if you want to be formal about it, is called the principle of least astonishment. Things should work the, people, the way that the people who use them expect them to work. Um, and I'm going to come back to this principle as we go. Developers uh, are not a single class of human, right? This is not a, a uniform thing like saying uh, fish. All fish are similar. Well, there are big fish and small fish. There are vegetarian fish. There are carnivorous fish. Uh, there are fish that don't even have fins. Um, developers are a bit like fish. So if you take that to its logical extreme, there are developers that love operating systems, right? Typically, they write operating systems. Maybe they work for Microsoft or they work for some Linux vendor. Um, but large organizations don't want to pay developers to work on things they find fun. They want to pay developers to work on things that provide value, which is typically closer to the customer. We want to get as close to the pain that our users are experiencing as possible. And we do that by embracing opinions. So rather than building using every possible operating system or every possible cloud, we're just going to not care. We're going to say, hey, we, we embrace certain services where there are cases where we want to be opinionated and we care deeply, and there are cases where we want to be agnostic and care not at all. And so it's important to give developers a set of choices and not say everyone has to write at the same level of abstraction. You all have to write serverless from now on. So at Pivotal, we embrace what we call the four abstractions. We think about writing kind of serverless code where you're just caring about your function and you don't even care about the rest of the application. Or maybe a layer down from that, we're writing applications, and we care about sets of services or microservices that talk to each other, but not where they run and the specific topology. Now, we do see use cases where even developers want to be at one level more detail, and they want to define the set of containers and where they'll be placed in relationship to each other, and we expose that as well. And then even one step further, where you want to deal with virtual machines, key infrastructure, kind of define your own services that have persistent storage and complex lifecycle for state. So all four of those abstractions are really important. But, as I said before, developers are like fish. So if we want to keep our developers happy, and they're not all unique, and they're working towards different abstractions, 
we have to expose them different tools and different technologies. Let's start with Spring, right? We have a, a long history of working in the Java community, and we came up with this, this technology a few years ago called Spring Boot, which has now become wildly successful. I think the estimate is 85% of all new Java projects are started in Spring Boot. Um, and it gives a very specific framework for building applications in Java. Uh, it's a set of opinions, if you like. If you're a Java developer and you don't want to think about the details of, well, how do I want to concatenate two strings? Great. Spring's got a way to do that. Uh, it's got a way to deal with having different services in your application talk to each other. It's got a way to deal with scaling out and load balancing and service discovery. Um, and it makes a set of opinionated choices. You don't have to use Spring, but it's one of the ways we address that. And the sense of openness is, if you want this language, here's a framework. We're now working together with, uh, with other partners in this ecosystem, including Microsoft, to make these same approaches work well in .NET. So you can have your best of class .NET applications also be open source, also be taking advantage of microservices and still run them anywhere. Let's talk about opinions one layer deeper. Let's talk about that abstraction of infrastructure. So Bosch has always been a part of Pivotal's technology stack. We think of it as sort of the secret sauce behind Cloud Foundry. And it is sort of the if you think of, you know, what we all used to do years ago with bash scripting or Perl scripting or Python or, or whatever to orchestrate infrastructure, right? Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt, Juju. Um, that's the opposite of Bosch. It solves the same problem, works the opposite way. So it really says here is a set of steps, run this script, get to some state. Bosch says, ignore the steps, define the state you want, and I will figure out how to get you there and keep you there forever. So these are state transitions. This is uh, what I like to call a narrow AI for deterministic infrastructure. So this is our opinion, and this is how we say, hey, whatever Bosch is running above could be Microsoft Azure, could be another public cloud, could be a, a private cloud powered by OpenStack, powered by vSphere. Uh, Bosch doesn't care. It's gonna get your system into a desired state and keep it there. Now that doesn't mean you don't care about the services provided by those underlying infrastructures, and that takes us to this last piece, Open Service Broker API. This was started originally by Pivotal, and uh, turned into an open source, open community project now embraced by the Kubernetes community, by Google, by other partners. And it really says, hey, here's a standard way of connecting applications to services, connecting the, the stateless world to the stateful world. The cool thing about this is it still embraces all three of those opens. It embraces any language, any location, any service. And this is kind of a crazy picture, but I wanted to sort of spell this out. You've got some app running in Cloud Foundry somewhere. It actually doesn't have to be running in Cloud Foundry. It could be running in Kubernetes. And it wants to bind to, let's say, a Redis cache. Well, that could just be running uh, as a sort of platform service operated by somebody as a Redis endpoint. Could be operated by Azure. So you've got Azure Redis. It could be spun up as a VM and brokered by Bosch for you on demand. It could be a single tenant or multi-tenant. It could be, the app doesn't have to care. And that's really the important abstraction we're saying is principle of least astonishment. Your developer wants to say, hey, my app needs Redis. If my app is running in dev, it should be using just Redis on my laptop. If it's running in this pre-prod environment, it should be using the Redis provided in a VM next to it. If it's off in production, it should be using Azure Redis. That separation of binding and brokering is so critical to providing that kind of freedom. Now, I've been talking a lot about the open side of this, but I want to emphasize the other side of the coin, right, which is security. Um, and I'm going to bring uh, a customer up for a second here, a little fireside chat to talk about um, why staying secure while being open is so important. Uh, but I, I wanted to make a Monty Python reference uh, because that's sort of what I do. So when I think of security, I kind of think of castles and moats, right? And what was the secret to uh, the castle and the moat in Monty Python? Does anyone remember? It's like, we've already got one. The secret was multi-tenancy. They don't have to share their holy grail. Like, we don't need to go with you to go find your holy grail. We have our own holy grail. And in fact, everyone's got their own holy grail in this movie, even though you never get to see it. It's perfectly secure. All joking aside, um, the, the hard part about security in an open world is usually addressed best by just fixing the multi-tenancy model. Hey, look, if, if this data service does not uh, protect users well from each other, just run multiple copies of it. 
I don't want to share Redis with you. Sorry, like we're friends, but we're not that good friends. I'll have my own Redis. You have your own Redis. That seems just fine, right? The, the technical term for this, and I think it was um, Snap came up with this. I should double check that, uh, is a limited blast radius, right? Things are going to go wrong. They're going to go wrong in prod. They're going to go wrong in pre-prod. They're going to go wrong every day somewhere in the world. And, and maybe it's a failure, and maybe it's a security compromise. The best position you can have is that the blast radius of that failure is really small, almost infinitesimal, and that there's other key infrastructure that can step in and, and take up the slack and say, okay, well, that Redis instance is gone. Uh, do we care? Mm, not really. It'll be back in 60 seconds or so, and in the meantime, there's other Redis instances and other versions of the app running elsewhere. So that separation of... Uh, tenancy from configuration is really an important part of this, this architecture. And I'm just talking about architecture here. I'm not really talking about individual projects. All right. I went over a bunch of technologies, and I talked a little bit about architecture, and I talked a little bit about open source. But what I skipped was, how do you make decisions? This all starts feeling really complicated. I have all of these choices. Any language I want, any location I want, any service I want, how do I pick? And since all of this is open source, how do I pick which things I build for myself, which things I just download from GitHub, and which things I actually buy and, and get real support for? Um, Parker Thompson used to work at Pivotal, and this was kind of his framework, is to say, well, you should really have the wisdom to know the difference. That's funny, but not very helpful as a piece of advice. So I'm, uh, I was inclined to go back to an old colleague of mine, Clayton Stark, uh, and this is not, obviously, he didn't say this. Deming said this first. But in God we trust, all others bring data. Right? Use the data, Luke. The data tells you when you should be building something yourself. And typically, that's when it's as close to your customers as possible. Right? You don't want to be the best in the world at what you do. You want to be the only one in the world at what you do. So if you're in the business of building distributed systems, you should be in a distributed system software company. You should probably come work for us. If you're in the business of uh, building video games, you should go and build video games, which is what Clayton does, right? He does not build his own distributed system. Um, and if you're in the business of dealing with, you know, millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions, I have no idea how many transactions a day of real valuable financial information, you should probably go work for MasterCard, uh, which is what my uh, good friend Rick Clark did recently. Rick, can you uh, come up here? Let's have a bit of a chat. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah, let's take a seat. I'm actually going to grab my water. I don't know if you brought yours. I did not. All right, well, I haven't opened that one, so there you go. Thank you. Oh, here, you can have it. I'm fine. Oh, thank you. Oh, there you go. All right. <laughs> so just for context, I introduced you. Uh, you know, you're the SVP at, at MasterCard. I think you own everything related to cloud, right? which is a... Digital transformation, I'd say. Cloud is part of it. Okay, very much. Um, but uh, I think I got to know you when we were both involved in OpenStack back in the, the very early days. So maybe we could start with uh, this transition. Um, MasterCard involved in open source. Is that, is that new? Is that a real thing? How do you think about that? Well, it's, it's not new. Um, I mean, I've only been there six months, and it predated me. Okay. So, <laughs> so it's at least six months old. It's at least six months old. But we, I right. mean, we have active contributors to Apache. So we, yeah. we, have, we actively use open source. Mm -hmm. we, uh, um, I think now it's becoming a larger part of the choice when we're, we're making decisions. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a bigger and bigger criteria. And it's not just a checkbox. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, the, the, the way open source is done matters to us too. Right. So with that as a backdrop... Um, why did you pick Cloud Foundry? What was the thinking there to say, hey, this could be good for MasterCard? Um, well, uh, there are many, many reasons, which we don't have time to go into. Sure. <laughs> but um, so I, the, the, the primary reason is that the abstraction layer works for us. Mm. That uh, when you're going through digital transformation, you, you, there, are, there are a bunch of things that have to happen. One of which is you have to retrain all the people working on Brownfield to eventually work on the new Greenfield stuff. And um, the abstraction layer provided by Cloud Foundry gives us the breathing room as we start moving applications so that we can do that. Mm -hmm. So we can start uh, increasing the, uh, the, the, the knowledge of our staff so that we can start working on other things right. and then sort of move down the stack on the diff different abstraction layers. Right. 
I, uh, I'm a parent, and I always tell my, my daughters, you can do anything but not everything. And I sort of feel like that's true for your team when you're going into you know, any sort of transformation. You can learn to do anything. You can't learn to do everything. So you've got to pick those abstractions. Well, you know, it's starting with, with something that you can actually do. So I, I, I've seen a lot of companies that start where, with, uh, we're going to build our own um, platform. And, and they've never done anything in the cloud before. This is their first thing, yeah. so they're going to do the most complicated thing possible because they, they know best. Right. right. Um, so we didn't start that way. <laughs> so um, there's obviously you know, a lot of players in, in the public cloud, and they've all been courting you know, all Cloud Foundry users, in fact, all of the Fortune 500. What is it about Azure that's exciting to you? Well, um, I would say that... I, this, I know this isn't their this isn't their their slogan, but mm. it's kind of cloud for grownups, right? Uh, so we're at Mastercard. We're a, we're a big company, and we this is our first foray in the cloud. Yeah, and we needed someone that could provide us the support that we needed, and that was building something that was uh, more tailored for us. Right. So it you know they've they've done a lot of handholding. They've been they were they were there when we needed them, and so the support I'd say is just number one. It's interesting. So, so Azure is cloud for grown-ups, and Pivotal gives you breathing room while you change. <laughs> <laughs> this, this makes sense. Um, you know, I guess the Cloud Foundry has a, a number of vendors. I would love to know, other than the fact that I'm awesome personally, what was it about Pivotal as a as a Cloud Foundry vendor that was? Uh, it was all you and James Waters. Yeah. That's, <laughs> no. Um, so. Um, this is again. This is new to us, right? We're 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 new to cloud, and we want to go with someone that has done this many many times. Mm -hmm. Let's not um, let's rely on the experience of others rather than iteratively failing ourselves many times. We're going with someone that we're not quite sure about. So we we know we knew we needed help mm -hmm. to deploy it correctly, mm -hmm. and we went with the people that had the most experience. Totally, it was really not much to think about for us. Right. Um, I do want to talk briefly about OpenStack, but really in the context of, you know, a lot of what I'm emphasizing here is these buy versus build decisions, right? Like you can download things from GitHub and run them, or you can figure out how to build a team and assemble stuff yourself. You can say, hey, we are going to go build our own platform. Um, and we saw a lot of people do that with OpenStack, right, for uh, a depressing number of years. Um, how do you, do you think there's a general principle for these sorts of decisions and you're talking to your peers and executives at other financial companies do you say hey here's how you think about what do you buy and what do you build i do <laughs> tell me <laughs> what is it <laughs> so i i think that everything that you build developers are a precious resource in your organization mm -hmm. right every line of code that you write should benefit your customers or shareholders shareholders so you shouldn't be writing things that don't benefit them and if you go back to that um, it it makes the decision easier also, I like to ask two questions: Is um, should we before can we? <laughs> so should should we do this? Right. Um, developers will want to do a lot because everyone thinks I can do this ten percent better. Um, but should we? Right. Even if you can, should we? Um, so I, I ask that question a lot to both my team at Mastercard mm -hmm. and I, I, I discuss that with other people in the industry. Right. Right. There's a, there's a lot of false attribution error. In, in the developer mindset, I think, which is like, well, other people have written bad code because they're bad people. I write bad code because it's technical debt and I was under pressure. <laughs> and so when we imagine writing code in the future, we imagine it's going to be flawless and therefore better than everyone else's code. And so there's a lot of like accidental hubris mm -hmm. in these buy versus build decisions. Um, and I think open source communities are a fun way to kind of watch that play out. Uh, but Let's, let's look at the Cloud Foundry Foundation for a second. What signal do you think it sends to have Microsoft joining the foundation so publicly? Well, I, I think it uh, sends a very, a very strong signal to us because we, we, are, we consider both Microsoft and Cloud Foundry to be in, important partners for us moving forward. Yeah. So um, the, the huge buy-in to the foundation, which is extremely important and a big part of our decision to go with, uh, with Cloud Foundry mm -hmm. is I mean, that gives us some, some confidence right. and security. You also mentioned there's, you know, it's not just that it's open source, but how is it open source and how is it built that, that is more and more a factor? And we see that across our whole customer base. Do you want to elaborate on that a bit? What is it about the community that's important to, to you and to MasterCard? 
Well, it's, it's that it can be collaborative and you can participate in the roadmap. Mm -hmm. So if uh, there are open source pro projects out there that are really just code escrow, right? right? I mean, um, as you and I both know from the, before the days of OpenStack, there, there, are, uh, there were cloud projects out there that didn't allow you to you know, contribute patches. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can't fix patches, if I can't, um, if I can't influence the direction, then it's, it's just like closed source to me. Right. So you know, having a uh, having not only the ability to uh, to submit my patches and and influence direction, but a foundation that is that is separate from any one company is is an important thing. And I would say that if I'm looking at any project, that I'm going to go for the one in the foundation before I go for one that's not, mm -hmm. regardless of the project and the company. Mm -hmm. When we think about you know what happened with OpenStack for sure, was this notion of, hey, private cloud, public cloud is still important, and what does hybrid look like in the future? And now we see Azure Stack on the horizon, um, and we see, you know, uh, certainly on the container side, things like OCI and Run C and, and even Kubernetes, which Pivotal has, has uh, adopted with, with Kubo and, and directly with Run C. Um, do you... Are you thinking carefully about the kind of hybrid story, the where, what goes into public cloud, what goes into private, how do we mix those? Or is it still a question of preserving optionality, right, and be able to move it later? Well, so for us, it's about preserving optionality, but it, that's because um, regulatory requirements are going to drive that for us. Right. Um, if, if I were at a different company where I didn't have regulatory requirements or I could only be in one country, I would just choose public, mm -hmm. personally. Right. Yeah, we see... Only a small number of Pivotal's customers, and, and because we, again, deal basically with the Fortune 500, most of them have some kind of hybrid mm. story. Um, well, what about myths? You know, there's the, I feel like open source 20 years ago, 30 years ago was simple because there was so little going on, and now it's beyond the point of so much going on that everyone's confused, and now it's even more than that, and people believe there are simple patterns, right? They, mm -hmm. they believe. So is there, are there cases where you say, well, I had a vendor come to me and say X, and they thought it was really important, and it's not a thing I even really care about? Um, yeah, I, I would say that we have a lot of, uh, a lot of misinformation that comes. <laughs> in terms of the fake, fake news, hashtag fake news yeah, in, yeah, in open source? Yeah, yeah. and you know, it's, some of it comes from one open source vendor about another Right. It's been, it's, and I don't want to call out vendors, sure. but uh, yeah, there's been quite a bit. And I've, you know, I've worked hard to make sure that we get uh, outside information mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't fall for those sorts of myths. Right, right. It's interesting. I, um, I think it's easiest in open source to see the personalities at work, you know, and to see the way that the, the sort of culture of the community forms around the early contributors. Right. And so that notion to your point of like, if it's just code escrow, if mm -hmm. it's just a way to be public about your source code, but not actually be collaborative, it doesn't really mm -hmm. help anyone, right? Um, the, you know, the other fake news thing I see, or I guess the question I would have is, what about standards? You know, because it used to be everything was about the standards body, the RFCs and the DMTF and the mm -hmm. whatever. But now it seems like the emergent, the, where the community consensus is, is the standard. Yeah, the, the, okay. the market sort of defines the standard and rather than, you know, ch right. chasing it. So I, 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 I firmly believe that, yeah. that the standard bodies, especially, and there, there are many, you probably know this, but many of the large vendors are involved in standard organizations just to slow them down. <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, so they tend to lag while, while people try to get their products, the companies mm -hmm. try to get their products right. So you know, whatever is out there and works, Ends right. up becoming the standard. Right. Um, just let me take this one step even weirder, right? So <laughs> you're saying, look, we, we work with the open source community because we can collaborate, we can influence the roadmap. We know that over time it's going to be more and more exactly what we need. And then you think about, okay, also we're working in a competitive world where we have other companies that want to get close to us in our market, you know, and I think in, in particular in the fintech startup space. Mm -hmm. um, do you make decisions inside MasterCard now on, hey, these things we're going to do in the open and these things we're going to just keep to ourselves because we think they're a competitive differentiator? Or is the goal always to out-execute and go faster? And, and is it open first as a policy? 
You know, I don't know if it's open first as a policy. Um, I mean, I, I think that there are reasons in our industry to, to not do that, separate from competition. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, there's a, a huge volume of financial information that flows across our network. So I, I, yeah. I think we're, we're, we are open when, when it's best mm -hmm. and, and not open when it's best. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Sam Ramji, when he was running the Cloud Foundry Foundation, was, was famous for having coined this idea of Cloud Foundry as a place of practice, right? And I think he was taking it in terms of sort of a Buddhist framing of, mm -hmm. of practice. But I actually like the idea of, uh, you know, deliberate iteration as kind of the hallmark of a healthy open source community. Um, but something that a really healthy community does well is to find when is it when is it ready for use and when is it still experimental, mm -hmm. you know. And I guess um, something we've been trying to be very deliberate <clears throat> about in the Cloud Foundry community is say, hey, every sub project releases whenever they want, which is sometimes every day, sometimes every week. But Cloud Foundry, Pivotal Cloud Foundry overall, is released every quarter on a steady cadence, and then once a month as a dot release. Um, we're trying to find that sweet spot between you know, the rapid, agile delivery of an open source community and what any big enterprise can rationally consume, right? Because CD is amazing. Mm -hmm. You don't want to CD everything every day, right? I, I don't want to go up to the terminal, point of sale terminal with my MasterCard and go to pay a bill and have all the buttons in a different <coughs> place every day. I'd be like, I, how do I tip? Oh, I guess the tip <laughs> options today are in Greek numerals or something, you know? Um, where do you see that? Where do you see that sweet spot between like go fast and go slow, or go fast and be safe? So you know, I, I guess it depends on where you are, so in, in the stack, your right. technology. So the way I like to think of things is that you release quickly with mm -hmm. versioned services, and then you let your customers decide when they accept them. Right. So that's that's kind of my my view of things, and hopefully everything works. So that what you've just said there, I think that's that's this key idea is that you have customers. That the internal service has customers, mm -hmm. and therefore you have your product. Each service is a product. The larger application is a product that has those as as vendors, and then you have your eventual end user customer. Um, do you think product management thinking is actually common yet? Because I guess what we see in digital transformation is it's the hardest thing to go teach. Hmm. companies is, is to have a product mindset and say, oh, I guess this is a product, not just an internal service. It's a real world thing. Um, how do you foster that? Are you just hiring a lot of people? <laughs> well, you know, some of it comes from, you know, culture comes from the top. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think we have at, at MasterCard have fostered that kind of culture and that's how we look at things. Mm -hmm. You know, the, any internal service we build, it's, it's, it's going to be a product and we're going to treat the users like customers. Right. Like we should. Right. Yeah. Um, on the, on the public cloud landscape, right? You mentioned, I mean, rationally, if you were a small startup, you'd probably just go all in on public cloud. Would you go all in on a single vendor or would you still look for multiple vendors? And how do you think about it, that? So landscape? it depends. It depends right. on where I need to be. If you look at someone like, you know, Netflix, that single vendors work for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that no matter who you are, I, th I think I can guarantee the resiliency of any public cloud provider is better than your resiliency now. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, all of this, yeah. all, all of the, the mental anguish about, oh, can we, well, it's, it's really just fake. Right. I mean, it's just, they're already better than you. Right. So, <laughs> so you could just pick one and go with one. Yeah. Now, they're not all in all the same places. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there, there's, there's some ease once you get used to writing to the services of one. Mm -hmm. So if I were, you know, if I only needed to be in the U.S., right. I would probably only go with one cloud provider and stay right. with them and develop a good partnership with them. Right. Because I'm not really worried about any cloud going down. Right. There's, you know, it, I, I'm not worried about it. Yeah. I still see, uh, you know, differentiation, kind of pretty interesting tech differentiation in the focus and the talent. And, you know, when you think about a company like Microsoft with tens of thousands of developers who've worked for decades on things like SQL Server, they know SQL really well. And you obviously have worked on SQL technologies Mm -hmm. Back in the day, <laughs> um, you know, how do you, how would you counsel other enterprises, other other ones of Pivotal's customers for when you make those decisions of saying just let your developers use whatever they want, or give them a pick list, or I don't think you can let them use whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> do I? 
I mean, yeah, that'd be great. It'd be great if you could, but that ends yeah. up being unmanageable. Yeah. And, and uh, there's no governance around it. Right. So, yeah, you, you, you have to be able to, um, those developers, if everyone does whatever they want, when one of them gets hit by a bus, then you're just out of luck. Yeah. So things have to be done with some sort of governance so that someone else can pick up. Yeah. And uh, so I, I wouldn't just say, yeah, take out your credit card, use whatever technologies you want. I, I think that would probably be a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the first day of I built it is the easy part. It's day two and day seven and day 400. It's like, oh, I need to patch it. And it's already a legacy. Mm -hmm. Every greenfield system turns into legacy eventually if it doesn't die. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Last thoughts, parting thoughts on these themes of like enterprise decisions around open source and around, uh, you know, the way that old vendors are reinventing themselves, new foundations, new technologies. Um, so I, I will say just about build versus buy. If you're not sure, don't build it. <laughs> so that's if, you, if, if there's any doubt, then you're making yeah. the wrong decision. <laughs> yeah. There was no, there was ambiguity in your previous of like, should I and can I? But now you're like, if you're not sure, don't. But so you know, what I didn't say is that the answer to should I is almost always no. Right. Unless it's the thing that you do, unless it's right. what your company does. Right. You know, what, what Pivotal does is, is make a platform, a cloud yeah. platform. Yeah. So you should do that. Yes. That's not what MasterCard does. Right. We should do the things we're good at. Right. Yeah. It's also why we don't do billing systems at all. You know, it's like we have not tried, but should not try. Other people would try. You know, yeah. somewhere there's a startup saying, you know what, none of these billing systems work for us. Let's build our own. But it's really complicated. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The reason they're hard to build is because there's a lot of details that mm -hmm. are not obvious. And actually that abstraction thing, the if you do a really good job of delivering the abstraction, people will assume your software is trivial mm -hmm. because using it should be mm -hmm. trivial. Right. But actually what it's doing behind is is not. So, yeah, very cool. Hey, I really appreciate you coming out for this. It's been uh, fantastic to have oh, you here. Anytime, Josh. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>
If you look back to the 1960s, it was a virtuous cycle whereby improvements in infrastructure and technology made previously in, intractable problems solvable, right? The birth of the x86 application platform led to falling cost when it comes to uh, mainframes, distributed architecture, distributed platforms, and decoupling mainframes from the entire thing. Really, what it did is it, it, it helped evolve the maturity of, of applications in x86 and cloud computing. And that's how we got to where we are today, right? Since all these improvements happened in parallel, though, new technologies began to emerge at an incredible rate, a larger rate than I think anyone actually is even comprehending. Uh, digital transformation, public and private cloud, hybrid cloud, hosted services have all led to the rise of cloud computing becoming mainstream. Some of the services that we use every day uh, have shifted our expectations as to what's possible. Simply put, our expectations have changed. We want the ability to use any software at any time, anywhere, without the burden of a maintenance window or unexpected outages. We are living in a world of perpetual beta, in a sense. These eco open ecosystems have also allowed engineers to have the ability to be able to choose the best tool for the job rather than being constrained by whatever is available from the underlying platform. We learned that open ecosystems yield better outcomes. Despite all this rapid innovation, customers are also demanding data be secured, that it's highly available, that it's redundant. They want it always on, they want it always accessible. So the best companies deliver better software and they do it faster, right? These change expectations have led to the simple reality. Companies that deliver better software stay in business. If you don't, well, then you don't exist. To deliver truly great software and exceptional digital experience, you need to understand application performance, the customer's experiences, and how software is impacting the business. Companies overall need to reduce time to validate builds so that they can actually promote things to production sooner. They need to reduce these testing efforts by using automation and orchestration to, to essentially decrease the time that it takes them to actually get these products to market. Uh, they need to detect bugs in applications sooner in the development cycle. Um, this is specifically because NASA actually did a study. And in the study, NASA noticed that depending on the time it takes you to actually determine and find a bug in your software, it actually costs you more to actually go back and remediate it, which is in incredibly interesting. And then obviously human error, right? We know humans are imperfect. And so by repeating and building automation and, do test, and doing testing through automation and resetting these environments back to uh, a, a, a no-fault state, um, you're able to actually guarantee your code is better and you're really empowering your developers. So what's the common thread, right? I'm talking about cloud computing and all these other things. The best solution for many clients is probably gonna be a hybrid cloud approach, at least currently. Uh, leveraging the power of both the public and private cloud infrastructure using a common operating system between either of the two different locations. And the reason why I say that is because, for the most part, you don't want two disparate different operating systems to manage because that's twice as much work for your operations team. By taking advantage of the ability to mix and match the best elements of private and public cloud by doing the hybrid cloud, companies can leverage greater flexibility and benefits from rapid uh, innovation. Finally, as with emerging technologies, it's important to align with cloud ecosystems that are based on open technologies in order to maintain choice and vendor flexibility. And remember, infrastructures matter. You hear from many different people that infrastructures don't matter. They absolutely do. Regardless of which type of cloud model you choose, it's the key element for your overall cloud strategy and business strategy. So Red Hat OpenShift, what is it? What's it do? How does it make your life better? So OpenShift lets you easily and quickly build, develop, and deploy nearly, into nearly any cloud infrastructure, private, public cloud, doesn't necessarily matter, hybrid cloud, Microsoft Azure. Uh, OpenShift can even be deployed as a managed offering in public clouds. And another interesting thing is you could actually run OpenShift on your own laptop. Uh, Red Hat offers both of these solutions with the OpenShift container platform, uh, dedicated and OpenShift container platform online. So regardless of which deployments model of OpenShift containers you choose, you'll have an award-winning platform to get to your next big ideas. Um, and OpenShift makes running an enterprise-grade con container platform easier, more simplified. It's open, it's extensible, it's portable, it's automated, it allows for collaboration between different developer groups. 
And since it's built on Kubernetes, it's designed to handle orchestration and management across clusters from very, very small to gigantic. Uh, there's a lot of big companies that are using Kubernetes and we, we don't even realize it in our daily lives. So how does OpenShift extend our reach? Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, OpenShift containers rely on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is trusted by pretty much all of the major Fortune 500s. Uh, we use features like control groups and namespaces. We use SE Linux to isolate slices of the underlying operating system. And the great thing about containers is that they're easier to build and consume compared to virtual machines. Uh, this allows us and enables us to run many containers on the same infrastructure and increase utilization that would otherwise be wasted. While containers provide many benefits infrastructure, they also pose a little bit of com complexities. So as you grow, as your environment gets larger, you have to start developing orchestration and figuring out how to manage at scale. From an application perspective, containers are a way to package a single entire application and all of its dependencies into this uh, self, you know, self-contained artifact that could be deployed in any location. It's easy to package applications that are already built. It's simple to share these applications across your organization. And developers have full control over the content and can package most everything and anything for running inside a container. So OpenShift also helps your operations teams deploy an enterprise-grade container platform. You know, a lot of times we have people that come to us and they say, well, if a lot of this stuff is open sourced, why can't I just take some of these things off the shelf and put them together and it, you know, everything works? And the truth of the matter is you could do that, but when something breaks, who's gonna support it? Who's gonna help you get through these trials and tribulations, right? And it's really important to realize that having an enterprise grade platform when you're running business mission critical applications and you need support, it, it, it's imperative. Um, our operations staff are here uh, to enforce fine green policies, leverage the power of Red Hat stability and support. And the important thing to know is that we're here for you when you need us, right? So for operations, some of the benefits, monitoring automatically uh, managing applications, um, automatic scaling up and down according to workloads. No more 4 a.m. calls saying this one server has exceeded its utilization and someone needs to go and fix it. Automate it. Enforce fine gang policies for authorization, networking, and multi-tenancy. So when you're looking at compliance-based stuff, it actually is integrated in there. And then obviously services and support from experts across the stack, right? Open, OpenShift is actually built on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which is the most trusted Linux that's in existence. And so you're really getting all the benefits of our support and our builds and our community. For developers, it's a little bit different. OpenShift enables developers to have full control over frameworks and runtimes without making things overly complex. Developers can create reproducible images which could then be shipped and ran in any OpenShift cluster without worrying about the underlying infrastructure. This could be Microsoft Azure, it could be your own data center, it could be in a hybrid cloud infrastructure. Uh, OpenShift provides developers a graphical interface for those that prefer such. It makes it easy to deploy containers since you have a web console or command line, or you could use the APIs. Um, and it has deep integration when it comes to continuous integration and continuous deployment solutions, such as like Git, Subversion, things along those lines. So continuous delivery pipeline, right? This is the holy grail. How does a deployment pipeline look like uh, when you're using OpenShift? What are the benefits of continuous integration, continuous deployment, CI, CD? Uh, it all begins with developers committing a uh, change to a source repository. Source repo is actually where you're storing all of your, your code builds. The CICD engine, for example, let's just say Jenkins, gets notified, which triggers a download of the application code from the source repo and rebuilds the application with the newly committed changes from the developer. With containers, the CICD engine at this stage will package the application as a container image all in one with all of its individual dependencies. And that can be deployed in a target environment, and it runs exactly the same of where the environment it is. Once again, completely agnostic infrastructure. Quick, simple, painless. Uh, public cloud services, uh, such as Microsoft Azure, when bundled with solutions like OpenShift for platform as a service and infrastructure as a service and containers as a service, uh, it, it allows you to embrace shared infrastructure to handle critical but tedious jobs like continuous delivery and you know, continuous integration, monitoring, metrics tracking, authorizations, all of these things that just are so monotonous to actually deal with on a daily basis. 
So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to lessen the roadblocks when for developers to write their code and get their code out the door as fast as possible. And by doing that, it also increases the, the value of business. Uh, I have a pre-recorded demo that I actually would like to show you. So let's jump into it. So what I wanted to show today is a little bit about OpenShift. Uh, OpenShift is actually very flexible, so it could run on any individual cloud. It's agnostic to the infrastructure. You could run this on your laptop, you could run this on Microsoft Azure, and you could run this in your data center. Um, so you could actually embrace a hybrid model. The great thing is the Red Hat Developer Suite, which we released recently, has the uh, container development kit built into it. So it's a single click button to deploy OpenShift on your own laptop to start your development process. So as you can see here that I've highlighted, this uh, OpenShift installation is actually running on my local laptop. Uh, this one's running in a private data center, and this one's running on Microsoft Azure. And let's go ahead and see the, what we have going on in Azure. So we have a couple projects in Azure. It uh, looks like somebody was building WordPress, and we have some CloudForm stuff, and we need to go create some new projects. So let's go ahead and do that. So first thing we want to do is we want to build out the projects. And you do that through OC new dash project dev dash dash display name, and then uh, specifically the display name that you want for the project. Something that's easy to understand. Okay. And then the next thing we want to do is we actually need to allow Jenkins to have permissions to access the OpenShift APIs. So you're going to do an OC policy uh, and you're going to add the role to the user specifically. In this case, project the CI CD, and then Jenkins is the user that we're actually giving uh, access to. And then let's see. We're going to go ahead now and run this script. So what this script actually does is it does a git clone. So it's actually going out to git, it's pulling down all of the information, um, and then it's actually storing it on my local laptop. And so what we want to do is we want to go to the OpenShift CD demo, and here we're going to actually run the command. So OC process dash F uh, CICD dash template YAML. And then we're going to pipe that to OC create dash F. OK, and now what we're seeing is that command actually pulled all of the images. So this YAML that's in here, let me go ahead and cut to that YAML for you real quick so you can actually take a look at it. This holds all of the information for the environment that we're building out right now, down to the very, very, very fine details of deploying the pods, um, when it comes to setting uh, limitations of resources, uh, things along those lines, right? And so let's see what do we have here. Well, it looks like everything was built out. We have our CI CD. And we have a dev and a stage environment. Let's see what uh, CI CD is showing. So it looks like it's in the process of still building everything out. Let's take a look and see what we have for events. It looks like a couple of these guys are running really slow with building. You can see the details here that are going to be assigned. And it looks like the GOGS install is running. Let's go back. So it looks like we have some of them up now. The Jenkins server is up. The Jenkins backend is up. Postgres has now been deployed for the Sonar Cube. And Nexus is being deployed, and GOGS is coming online now. So let's take a look at our Jenkins pod. 
you could look at the environment variable. So uh, open uh, enable OpenShift auth is set to true. So it's gonna use single sign-on between uh, the Jenkins server and OpenShift. And if we go back over here, when we click the Jenkins CI CD, we see that Jenkins is tied in. So let's go ahead and log in here. And we see that Jenkins is set up and it looks like there's a CI CD task pipeline that's already been built. So if we go back over the console and we go to application or go to builds, we see there's no builds currently. If we look at the pipeline, there's a pipeline that's created from Jenkins, um, but it's not running yet at this, at this point. We're gonna actually get that running in a second. So the next thing we need to do is make sure all the other services are online before we actually start building some stuff out. So if we go to GOGS, GOGS should load, which it does. And here's our repo for our code, right? OpenShift tasks. This is something that our developers are working on. And let's look at Nexus. And you can see Nexus is holding our repos, but under here, there's actually no snapshots currently. And then we wanna take a look at SonarCube. And Sonar Cube, obviously, as you can see here also, there's no projects built currently. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna build a project. So if we go into OpenShift and we say pipelines, a pipeline is essentially a way for you to matriculate your code from development all the way to production or to a staging environment where you can then roll it out to production. And usually this is uh, really great for developers to actually use because it, it helps them uh, decouple themselves from operations and, and having to use operations for time. So we'll start the pipeline. And when I start that pipeline, you actually notice in Jenkins that it also started a build. And this is the console output, output of the, the build. You could actually look at it through here, or you could actually look at it also through OpenShift because they're tied in together. So this build is gonna run. It's gonna take it a couple of minutes uh, and hopefully it succeeds. Now, while that's actually running, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the information. So OpenShift stores all of your individual secrets that you are using for authentication. It has your configure maps, your memberships. If you had a quota specified on the user, you would actually be able to see it here. There's no builds to show currently because we're not building anything. And these are images that we actually pulled down and built from. So the Sonar Cube image, the GOGS image, and the Nexus image. If we look at deployments, you can see the deployments that we recently have done. So you can actually see the GOGs, the Jinx and Jenkins, Nexus, and then the databases that are backing things up in Sonar. And then if we look at the pods, we see a list of all individual pods. Now pod is a representation of, of a service or an application in a sense. And then here you can actually see the services and these services actually manage the pods. And the reason why I say they manage it is um, if you actually go through, if someone accidentally, inadvertently deleted this pod right here, the service says that there's supposed to be at least one pod running it all the time. So if someone de deletes it by accident or maliciously, the service will notice that that pod has actually failed and it'll go ahead and it'll restart that pod again. So let's take a look at how our build's doing. Awesome, looks like it's ready to go. So it's sitting here and it's waiting for us to actually promote it to staging. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna promote that to staging. And if we go back into the console here, we go to CICD, and you look at the tasks dev, because it's been promoted, it's now in the development environment. And then if you look in the staging environment, it's either built or building, it looks like it's already done. So we just actually completed a build of software. That's, that's only one thing, that's, let's, let's go ahead and and have some fun. Let's break things. So we'll go into Jenkins. Make sure that everything is ready to go in Jenkins. And then we're gonna go into GOGS. And we're gonna go into the EAP branch. 
And this developer, I know that he likes to write really bad code. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to tinker with this code and see if I can figure things out. So we're going to go to source, test, Java, or JBoss. Yes, and quick starts, and taskers, and service. And we're going to go to the user resource test Java. Now looking at this, looks like an old pretty standard build. But wait, there's this interesting ignore line. I wonder what that's for. Well, let's find out. So we're going to edit his code. Now, the cool thing is, once we edit his code, and we commit this change back to the repo, OpenShift, because it's talking to Jenkins and it's talking to the repo, it knows that there's been a build that's been instantiated. So it'll actually grab it and pull it out, and it'll rebuild that, that application again, just by a single change from a single developer. So we committed that change. Let's see what Jenkins is doing. Well, we see it's building again. And it looks like it's getting started. And if we go into OpenShift, you can actually see in the CI CD and go to the pipeline here too. You don't have to go into Jenkins. You can see it either way. Looks like it's taking a few minutes to build. While it's building, let's look at a couple other things. So these are our applications that are deployed. And these are actually our pods that are running. And routes is actually one of the most interesting things. So when you actually deploy a pod, it's actually not exposed and accessible ex externally, right? You actually have to create a route so that people can actually route traffic to the pod or consume the application. Let's see where our build's doing. Uh oh, looks like our bid build failed. Let's take a look and see what's happening here. Well, it looks like there's no shell scripting for it, but you know what? I know this developer, I know exactly where he made the mistake. So let's go ahead and fix that for him. So we're gonna go back into the OpenShift tasks. We're gonna go to source, and we're gonna go to the main branch. We're gonna go to Java and org, JBoss AS, quick starts, taskers, service, and then we wanna go to uh, user resource Java. Yep, just as I thought. He he commented out all of the stuff that we need for our application to run. So let's go ahead and make that change. And mind you, you could actually do this using Git if you wanted to. You could just do a Git checkout. You could make the configuration change. You could do a commit, and you could push this up to Git as well. You don't have to use the user interfaces I'm doing right now. Some people prefer the UI. Some people don't. But that's the great thing about all of these different solutions is anyone who wants to use a user interface with OpenShift, we have it for you. Some people who want to do um, APIs, we have that as well. And some people who want to do command line, we also have that. So let's commit this change. Hopefully this fixes it. So we see, if we refresh snapshots, we see the first build that we did. So it looks like that build went fine. Let's look at pipeline. So now we have the, after we did and committed that last change, now it's in the process of building out another version of that software, that application with the changes that I put in. So we removed those forward slashes because they were, they were commenting out code that we actually needed to use to run our application. And by looking at this, it looks like the build is actually succeeding. Nope, looks like I messed up on the code. We're going to have to go take a look. Oh, I see where I made a mistake. It's a user error. I, en I entered the wrong branch. Looks like the developer is not the only one who makes mistakes. Let's commit this change. And let's watch Jenkins run again. And this time it should complete. Let's 
let's take a look in here. You can see the builds that are going on for the pipeline. So we see it's completed the first portion. This is the code that is pulled. So the build strategy is Jenkins pipeline. The source type is none. If it was a certain source type, you could specify that. So far, it's looking a lot better than it did before. Well, it looks like it passed test. We're getting closer. It's pushing to Nexus. Looks like it's going to deploy to dev. It's slow. Must need coffee like I do. And it looks like it completed. So now it's asking me once again, can I push this to staging? I think so. I think we figured it out. So it went ahead and it pushed it to staging. So now if we go in, we see in Jenkins, everything turned out fine. If we look in Sonar Cube, let's refresh this. You can actually see the application. If we dig into the application itself, we're able to see if there's any vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. Looks like uh, there's eight bugs and one vulnerability. My developers aren't doing a really good job about keeping this code maintained. If you go into the Nexus repository, you can actually see in here that the builds that we completed are actually live. These are all the builds that we completed that were successful. And the changes were all committed in the GOGs at the same time, so multiple users could be working in this directory. And there you go. That's a continuous integration pipeline from beginning to end with just a few, uh, few small scripts and then running on Microsoft Azure. So I just wanted to thank all of you for coming out today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the demo. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to anybody in the Microsoft Azure team or at Red Hat. We'd be more than glad to talk to you more about OpenShift and how uh, our solutions integrate directly with Microsoft Azure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. welcome Nell Shamrell Harrington, Senior Software Development Engineer at Chef. Hello, everyone. I'd like to start off today with a question. What if you could build software once and run it anywhere? What if you could, whether it's a bare metal server, a virtual machine, or in a container? What if you could move a legacy application into the cloud without having to rewrite it? What if you could empower your applications to recover from failure on their own without the need for a central orchestrator? Well, I have news for you. You can do all of these things today with Habitat, a new open source technology from Chef. Habitat is application automation. It goes beyond infrastructure automation, beyond cloud automation, and it's the new world of application automation. Now we'll go deeper into what this means in just a moment, but first let's cover who I am. I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington. I'm a senior software engineer at Chef. I'm a core maintainer of the Habitat open source project. I'm also the co-host of the Food Fight Show podcast where we discuss Chef, DevOps, and everything beyond and in between. You can tweet at me at at Nell Shamrell or feel free to email me at nshamrell at chef.io. And I will put these details back up on the screen at the end of the presentation. So the reason I was asked to speak here today is because, as I mentioned, Habitat is 100% open source. It's distributed under an Apache license, and if you want to check out the code, head on over to github.com slash habitat hyphen sh, where you will see all the repos that make up Habitat. So before we go into exactly what Habitat is, it's important to first understand the why of Habitat. Why was it created in the first place? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Building and running software is very painful. 
You have different run times tied to different environments. You need one run time for a Ruby application and a different one for a Java application. You need different packages for different flavors of Linux. You need a yum package for Red Hat Linux and deb packages for Debian flavored systems. Additionally, you need different types of packages for bare metal and virtual machines and container images. Now, Habitat seeks to alleviate this pain through building and running modern applications, through transforming applications, including legacy applications, into what we call modern applications. Now, a modern application has a few key characteristics. First of all, it must be immutable. It must be agnostic to runtime environment. It should reduce complexity when it comes to automating it rather than adding in complexity. And it should enable scaling. So that's the why of Habitat. Now let's cover what exactly Habitat is. Briefly, Habitat is a new technology to build, deploy, and manage applications. In any environment, from traditional data centers to the bleeding edge containerized microservices of today. In Habitat, the application itself is the unit of automation. That application package we create contains everything we need to deploy, run, and manage the application. And the clearest way to understand how this works is to look at the workflows for both packaging and running an application with Habitat. So when you package an application with Habitat, it starts with the user. This is you at your workstation. It doesn't matter if it's Windows, Mac, Linux, Habitat works on all of them. And that workstation, you're going to create a plan. This plan will include instructions on how the application should be set up wherever it is deployed, and we will look at a live example of this in just a moment. So when you are creating a package for a Linux system, you would write this plan in Bash. Eventually, you will also be able to create packages for Windows, and you would write those plans in PowerShell. Now, when you use that plan in the compiled application code to create an artifact that contains everything in one place, now, this artifact is cryptographically signed with a key, and I'll show you how that key is used in just a moment. Then you can optionally upload that artifact to the public Habitat Depot, where you can find Habitat packages by developers all over the world. Now, when it comes time to, oh, if you'd like to check out the public depot, head on over to app.habitat.sh and click on Depot. And what you'll see there is you'll see a interface that looks very similar to this. And in this screenshot shot, we are looking for all Habitat packages uploaded to the public depot that will install Node. So this is how you package an application with Habitat. Now let's go through how you would run that application with Habitat. And this is where we use what we call the Habitat supervisor to actually run that package. So if you have your application artifact on the depot, you can find it on that depot then pull that artifact from the depot and pull it onto wherever you want to run it. It will run the same on bare metal, virtual machines, and containers. Now, if you are not using the depot, you can also upload that package from your local workstation to wherever you want to run it. And we'll see an example of that in just a moment. So you then run that package as a service within what we call the supervisor. And we'll go more in depth into the supervisor and services a little later. So once you have that application running somewhere, in this example, it's in a virtual machine, you can still get information in and out of it through a standard RESTful API. This is really useful when you have something like a load balancer that needs to send traffic to that application, run health checks, and more. There's a standard RESTful API for it. And the real magic of Habitat comes when you have more than one instance of an application running. So let's say we have four virtual machines running the same package. The supervisors on each of these virtual machines form a ring. They will use that key we use to sign the package to decide whether to allow other virtual machines into the ring. They all have to be signed with the same key in order to be able to communicate with each other. And they do this communication over an encrypted gossip protocol, which they can later use to self-organize into different topologies. And we'll look at an example of that a little later too. 
So when I spoke to Jamie Windsor before I came onto the Habitat core team, he described Habitat as an umbrella over many components, all designed to allow you to build software once and run it anywhere. Now, many of these components are still in development, including the builder service, which if you want to learn more about that, head on over to the Chef website and you can see a keynote from Chef Comp, which will demonstrate it. Now, a lot of other components are still in development, and even though they are very promising, I'm here to talk about what you can do with Habitat today, how you can create and run application packages nearly anywhere, how you can move existing applications into the cloud and give your applications the intelligence to recover from failure on their own without the need for a central orchestrator or controller. I want us to understand what we can do with Habitat today because this is an open source project, and this project will largely be driven by our community of users and contributors. Together, we will shape where it goes in the future. So first, we will discuss the Habitat Supervisor. This is what you use to run your application packages. And again, this is where the true genius of Habitat shines. Next, we'll discuss the Habitat packaging format. This is what you use on your workstation to make that software artifact that can run nearly anywhere. So this is where, what you will run with that supervisor. And finally, we'll touch on Habitat with containers. Now, you can use Habitat without containers, but it really shines when it comes to working with containers like Docker. Habitat complements things like Docker and Mesosphere and Kubernetes and makes them work even better. So let's go ahead and start with the Habitat Supervisor. The Habitat Supervisor does a few things. One of the main things it does is act as a process manager. So this means when you pull that artifact from the depot onto whatever infrastructure you want to run it on, this Habitat Supervisor will start up and monitor that package. It will also receive and implement configuration changes. Uh, applications these days don't stay static for very long. So when a new version of that package is uploaded to the public depot, let's say for a security patch, the supervisor will be monitoring that depot, become aware of it, and pull in that new package, install it, and make whatever configuration changes are needed. And it also runs services. So before we go into a demo of this, let's briefly cover what I mean by a service. A service is one Habitat package running under one supervisor. And the simplest example of this is one supervisor running one service on one piece of infrastructure, whether that's a bare metal server, a virtual machine, or a container. So one service running would look kind of like this. We'd have one virtual machine running one service under one supervisor. But that's enough with the talking. Let's look at a demo of this simple example. All right, so in this demo, I'm on a local workstation right here, a local Linux workstation. And in it, I have a Habitat package that I just built. We'll look into exactly how you build these in a little bit. But this is my most recent build. Now, I want to deploy that to a virtual machine in Microsoft Azure. And to do that, I've already created that virtual machine, but I've done nothing more than create it. I am going to go ahead and SCP this package. Take the build right there. And I'm going to SCP that up to my Azure Virtual Machine. That's the IP address. And once I do that, it's going to SCP it up. And then I'm going to SSH into that same virtual machine so I can see this package there and then install it. So going ahead and SSHing in, and there is the package I'm going to install. We're on the virtual machine now. And in order to install that, I am first going to install Habitat. Remember, I've done nothing to this virtual machine other than in, in, uh, set, set it up through the Azure web framework. So once I install Habitat, I can then install this package, sudo hab install, and then I'm going to put in the package itself. And that's going to go ahead and install it. And I sped this up just a little bit for the sake of saving time. And then I am going to, before I can run this application, I need to add a HAB group to my system. So I'm going to add that in. And once that is added, 
There it goes. I'm going to need to add in a HAB user. And I'm going to add into that HAB group, and then I can start the Habitat service. That is all I need to do in order to be able to start this application. Now, this is a Node application, and it's running on port 8080 of my virtual machine. So if I head on over into my web browser and go to port 8080, there's my running application. So this was a bare minimum, you know, bare virtual machine just spun up in Azure. And in that little bit of time, I now have a running application in it. Let's go back to the slides. So this was a simple example, one supervisor running one service, in this case, a Node.js application. But that's pretty limiting. When we go beyond one service, when we scale out, we need a supervisor ring. So let's look at an example of this. Let's say we start off with one supervisor on a virtual machine running MySQL, and we decide we want a MySQL cluster. So we spin up two more virtual machines and install the MySQL Habitat package on them. So since that MySQL package is signed with the same key, these three virtual machines will be allowed to form a supervisor ring. What this ring allows these virtual machines to do is to communicate with each other over that gossip protocol. Remember, all of this communication is encrypted. And with a cluster like this, it's common to use a leader follower topology. What this means is once we have these three virtual machines running that MySQL service, they need to elect a leader. So Habitat has a built-in algorithm for electing a, a leader in a cluster such as this that does not require any human or any outside orchestrator intervention. So when we run that election algorithm, let's say it decides this one at the top is the leader. So that means it's going to receive all the right requests that come with that MySQL cluster. And that means these two at the bottom are designated as followers, and they'll receive the read requests that come into that cluster. Now, let's say that something bad happens and that leader goes offline. Because they're in that supervisor ring, the other two are going to realize they cannot connect to the leader, and they're going to go ahead and take it out of that ring. So now we're down to two virtual machines, and at the moment, both of them are still followers. So they're going to hold another election to make sure they're in that leader-follower topology. So they hold that election using that built-in algorithm, and let's say this one on this side wins the election and becomes the leader, it will automatically start receiving write requests. And this one on the other side will become the follower and start receiving read requests. So all of this was done without the need for human involvement or an orchestrator's involvement. What this illustrates is that Habitat assumes that failures will happen and that they are normal. We don't try to anticipate every edge case in the beginning because, frankly, we just can't there will always be something unforeseen that happens somewhere in an application's life cycle. The remaining healthy components have the intelligence to self-organize and reconverge on their own. There's no central coordinator that reorganizes and reconverges them. Again, they have the intelligence to do this by themselves. So the Habitat supervisor supports two different topologies at this time. The first one is the one we just saw, that's the leader-follower topology. And then the next one is the standalone topology. And in this one, we assume that every member of the supervisor ring is working as an individual, but happens to be in communication with all of the others. So the supervisor is also in charge of handling updates to the package or configuration changes and rolling them out to the rest of the ring. So again, it's going to detect when a new release becomes available on that depot and then deploy it according to a defined update strategy. Now, the only update strategy currently supported is all at once. So that means when a new package becomes available, all the supervisors in the ring will update to that new package immediately. However, we will soon add one called rollout. This means that a supervisor ring, say it has four supervisors, one will update, then the next one will update, and the next one, and so on. So only one supervisor will be updating at any given time. So that's the supervisor, which is used to supervise and manage applications packaged with Habitat. Now let's step back in the process just a little bit and talk about how we make that package for the supervisor to supervise. And we do that using the Habitat packaging format. This is what you use to create the artifact on your workstation. Now, these packages are in the heart format. We like to say it's because we heart you, uh, but it actually stands for Habitat Artifact. 
And these packages contain the compiled application itself and everything needed to deploy and run that application. That's that plan file we saw, which we'll see one in action in just a moment. And enough with talking about it, let's see this packaging format in action and go to the next demo. All right, so this case, again, I'm on my workstation. And I'm in a repo for a Node.js application here called My Tutorial App. And it has a habitat directory and a source directory. So let's head on into source. This is where the actual application code is. And we've got a few files here. The first one we'll look at is the server.js. And what this file does is, as you, as you can see, it gets the values of a few variables and uh, starts a listening website. So after the server.js, we also have a config file. And this is where we have the values for those variables I just mentioned. So server.js is going to pull these values from this config file. And then after this file, let's go ahead and exit out of here. There we go. Let's also look at this package.json file. And what this does is it defines metadata for our Node application. In particular, it defines dependencies. This is going to be important in just a moment. So our Node application is dependent on the nconf package. So after that, let's go ahead and close out of here. And let's uh, cd up one directory. Let's go ahead and do that. And then let's look at the habitat directory. And this is where we're going to create that plan.sh. So this is kind of the core of habitat. This defines how you deploy, build and deploy this application. So first of all, we have some metadata here with some information about our application. And the first thing I'm going to add in is the origin. This is kind of like the namespace for your application. And it's a way to store keys and use for key authentication on the depot. So after that, I've got my package name, which is my tutorial app. And the next thing I need to define is any dependencies of this package. So I do, it depends on core node, which we saw we were looking for in the public depot. It's a node package under the core namespace. And then we need to export a couple of things. So we are going to export a port variable for what port this application should be running on. And that is defined in a separate file, which if you want to see that file, head on over to habitat.sh and check out the tutorial. But we are going to take that variable listening port and assign it to the variable port in this uh, plan. So next, we need to define the exposed port. When we're running with Docker, we need, a, we need to define which port we want to expose for that application to run on. So in this case, we're going to use that port variable we just created. And the next thing we need to add are what are called callbacks. So all we have so far is just metadata about our package. Now we need to define how we build and install it. So the first one is do build. That's our first standard callback. This defines, and it's written in Bash as you can see, how we build this application. So we're copying a few things, and we're running npm install to install any dependencies. And then our second callback is do install. And what this does is it, also written in Bash, defines how we install that package on a virtual machine container wherever we're going to run it. So after that, we can go ahead and exit out of this plan. And then to build it, I'm going to head back into the uh, root directory for my app. And I'm going to use what's called the Habitat Studio. The Habitat Studio is a true-rooted environment that's essentially a clean room to build your package. So you'll be able to build this and install it without affecting your local workstation. So when I head into the Studio for the first time, it's going to install a few things. And then when I want to build that application using that plan we just created, all I do is run the command build. So I'm going to run that, and it's going to install my application, or it's going to build my application, excuse me. And I know that it successfully built it when I see this message, which is, I love when a plan.sh comes together. So after this, I can exit out of the studio now that I've built my application. Let's go ahead and exit. There we go. And then if I look in this results directory, I'm going to see my built, uh, freshly built package. So that's what we took in the first demo, put on that virtual machine, and installed it and ran it. 
So I do want to add that this is only part of the process. There's a little bit more we need to do to make this runnable and deployable. If you'd like to see the rest of those steps, head on over to habitat.sh and again, check out the tutorial. And with that, let's head on back to the slides. So Habitat packages use Bash for packages that will run with Linux. Now soon, you will also be able to create packages for Windows using PowerShell, and that's currently in development. So along with running Heart packages with Habitat, you can also export them to other formats. And by far the most popular format is Docker container images. And with that, let's touch on Habitat and containers. Now, as we already saw in the first demo, Habitat does work very well without containers, but it shines the most when it's used with them. So getting a software package to run anywhere is very difficult. That's, that's not a new problem. We all know that. Now, containers were supposed to solve this problem, but there's still some pain with them currently. And one of the biggest points is there's a major learning quit cliff between using containers in development and using them in production. Additionally, containers have a tendency to become black boxes, where we deploy them to different environments without fully understanding everything that is inside them, particularly when we're pulling them off of the Docker container registry. And this can introduce security issues. If I have an entire operating system in a container, but I'm only using part of it, I can potentially forget about the rest of that operating system and then not update it when new security vulnerabilities are revealed. So the reason for this is that traditional containers, if you can call containers traditional, I suppose, they've only been around a few years, but they start by building the, app, the operating system in that container first, then the application libraries, then finally the application itself at the very end. So this adds a lot of bloat and complexity to containers and probably a lot of things we don't actually need to use. What Habitat does is it turns this container workflow on its head. You start with just the application. Once you have that application, you add in the libraries to run that application, and then only at the very end of it do you add in a bare minimum operating system that is just enough to run your application and nothing more. That operating system starts with just slash bin slash sh. And then anything else your application needs, it can pull in through that plan.sh. So Habitat, again, starts with the application, and that minimal operating system comes later. The application itself is what declares those dependencies. We don't add in dependencies preemptively, and the dependencies are resolved from the application itself. And you still have that exposed API for external services. Even though my application is running in, in a container, I still have a standard API for a load balancer or any outside services that need to communicate with it. So when you create a container image with Habitat, you know exactly what went into the container and exactly what is configurable about that container. It's not a black box. Now let's look at this in action with our last demo. So let's head on over to the demo and let's see an example of exporting a Habitat package into a uh, Docker container image. Here we go. So first thing is I'm back here on my workstation and we've already built that uh, package for my tutorial app. So we're gonna head back into that studio and this is where we can export that built package as a Docker image. It's very simple. You just run the habit package, export Docker, then define your uh, origin and the name of your app. Now I have sped this up just a little bit for the sake of time this demo, but it's going to go ahead and create that Docker container image. And then I'm going to be able to exit out of the studio. So let's do that now. And then I can start that Docker container. It's immediately available for use on my workstation. So I'm gonna start it with sudo docker run. I'm gonna pass it the port I want it to run on and tell it what Docker image to run uh, on that container it's going to spin up. So it's going to do this, and it starts, uh, starts that application on port 8080 on my local workstation. And if I head on over into browser, here we go, and put in localhost port 8080, I'm gonna see my running application. So it's super quick and super simple to get your application into a container image. Going back to the slides. 
So when you can, it's you, once you have that container image, you can run it locally like we just did, but it's not going to do much good just sitting on your workstation. So you can deploy that container using container scheduling services like Kubernetes, Mesosphere, Docker Swarm. One of the big questions I get about Habitat is, is, is it a competitor to these? It is not. It works with them. You can also use cloud-based container services, such as Azure Container Services or other cloud container services. Now, as we wrap up, there are a few things I would like to you to take with you today. And the first is that you can build software once and run it almost anywhere. You can move a legacy application into the cloud without having to rewrite it. And you can empower your applications to recover from failure on their own. You can do all of these things today with Habitat. The key to remember is that Habitat is not infrastructure automation. It's not container automation. It's application automation. The application itself is what we're automating. So if you'd like to get involved, and I hope you do, head on over to habitat.sh slash community. And with that, I, again, I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington. That's my contact info. And thank you. Please welcome Gabe Munroy, Lead Program Manager at Microsoft Azure and former Chief Technology Officer at Deus, along with Michelle Nurelli, Senior Software Engineer at Microsoft Azure and Core Maintainer of the Kubernetes Helm Project. Hey everyone, thanks for coming to our session today. I'm Michelle Nurelli and I'm an engineer on the Azure Container Service team. I mostly work on open source tools that make Kubernetes easier to use, and we'll talk about some of those tools today. And I also run a special interest group uh, that's focused on how to define and manage applications on Kubernetes. And this is Gabe. Gabe, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabe Monroy. I am the lead program manager for Microsoft Azure uh, Container Service and uh, former chief technology officer at Deus. Um, just recently joined Microsoft via the Deus acquisition. Excited to share a lot of what we have uh, been working on in terms of open source over the last few weeks. And um, yeah, uh, you know, one of the things at Deus that we've been really excited about is trying to make containers easier to use um, with a specific focus around Kubernetes. So we're going to share a little bit about that today. And we started this journey uh, about two years ago. I remember when uh, Gabe come up, came up to me and said, hey, Michelle, what do you think about this Kubernetes thing? And at the time, I was a few months into learning about containers and playing with Docker. But I remember thinking, Kubernetes is a really clean way to orchestrate containers. And I was personally impressed by some of the powerful abstractions that it provided for things like managing your cluster and rolling out new versions of your software. And her whole team was pretty sold on the idea that Kubernetes was the right abstraction layer for these kinds of things. So then it came time to really test it out and hit the ground running with real life applications. But to run an application in Kubernetes, we needed to define and create multiple Kubernetes resources. So for example, for a simple app, you might need a pod. And inside of that pod, you'll run uh, your container or a group of containers that are tightly coupled for your application. You'll also probably define a Kubernetes deployment resource type because deployments um, help with managing rollouts of different versions of your application. And that's a pretty powerful feature as well as a best practice. So when you update your application, the deployment you define will do things like scale down your old version gracefully and scale new pods up with your new containers for your updated application. And the last piece is defining a service. A service in Kubernetes defines how things inside of your cluster communicate with your application, as well as things outside of your cluster like the rest of the world and how that communicates with your application. So right off the bat, we're defining multiple Kubernetes resources to make our applications work. And the process of managing those resources was becoming a really tedious task. 
we were finding that we really wanted a way to install this group of files or a package of files uh, which had related Kubernetes resources in them. And we wanted a way to keep track of those resources and do things like upgrade, rollback, and delete on this group of installed resources. Basically, we wanted to treat these resources in Kubernetes like one logical unit. So we realized what we need was a package manager for Kubernetes, something that would make it easy to install and manage a group of Kubernetes resource files. We looked around and realized what, that we wanted a, an apps get or yum install or homebrew like experience for Kubernetes. These are common package managers for operating systems, and they make it easy to install software onto your computer. So why not something like that for Kubernetes? So we built a tool called Helm. In Helm, a package is a chart. It's called a chart. And a chart is an application definition. It consists of some metadata, it also has the Kubernetes resource definitions that you'll need for your chart. This is the bulk of the actual chart. These resource definitions can be templated or non-templated. Um, if they are templated, the configuration will live inside of the chart as well. And the last piece is documentation. Um, this documentation is important for people who are consuming your chart to understand what to do with it. And charts live in chart repositories. This is a basic HTTP web server with an index.yaml file in the root that gives you some metadata about how to find your actual chart. And so a chart is one of the three basic core components of Helm. And like we talked about before, the chart is the expert built recipe for installing an application. The values are user-supplied configuration. Now this config can live inside of your chart, but you can also override it with a file that has your configuration outside of the chart. And a release is an instance of a chart and a values file that gets deployed into your Kubernetes cluster. So release equals chart plus values. Chart is the recipe, values is some extra sauce that you add to your application, some knobs that you can twist and turn. And um, the release in the Kubernetes cluster is the thing that is uh, what you're gonna roll back and upgrade and delete and manage. So you might be wondering, how do you get started with Helm? Once you've got the binary, the first command to run is Helm init. Helm init does two things. It configures uh, your local machine to work with Helm, and it also installs a server-side component called Tiller in your Kubernetes cluster. Now, once you run a Helm init, you can actually use kubectl, which is the Kubernetes command line interface tool, to see that Tiller is running in your um, Kubernetes uh, cluster in the kube system namespace. So you might do commands like, kubectl get pods dash namespace kube system. And you'll see that tiller is at the bottom there and it's running and that's when you know you're ready to go. Um, this should take a few seconds. It's a really smooth process. So let's get into it and see what Helm has to offer. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is see what a basic chart looks like. So to do that, you can scaffold out a brand new chart with whatever name you want. Um, I'll call this my chart. So if I do an LS on my chart, we can see the basic structure that we get. A chart usually has a chart.yaml file. This is the metadata that I was referring to before. It has a templates directory. This is the bulk of your, where the bulk of your chart lives. Um, this is going to house the Kubernetes resource files. And the values.yaml values .yaml file is the default configuration for your chart. The charts directory inside of your chart can uh, help you or allow you to vendor in other charts that are dependencies for your chart. All right, so now that we know what a chart looks and feels like, let's see if we can find one and install it into our cluster. So to do that, I'll use the Helm search command. And I'll search for Redis. So here we see we have a stable slash Redis chart. 
Um, Stable is the chart repository that the Redis chart, in this case, lives in. Uh, a chart is always namespaced by the chart repository that it lives in um, so that you avoid naming conflicts. Let's see what versions of Redis we have available. Mm. We'll do that using the dash L flag to list out the versions. And let's go ahead and install uh, 0.5.0 so we can see what an upgrade looks like. And you do that using the Helm install command, but if you want to see what the default configuration looks like, you can actually use a different command called Helm inspect. Helm inspect allows you to fetch the charts, uh, just the default configuration, and display that in your terminal. So I'll do a Helm inst inspect stable Redis for the version, let's say 0.5.0. And this is all the default configuration. So let's check out this uh, image here. The image that we're going to run from this chart is uh, 3.2.8. And that's good to note because when we bump it up, this is the thing that's going to change. So let's go ahead and install that chart into our cluster. So several things happened here. Let's go back and kind of dis dissect this output. Here we have a name. Uh, this is a randomly generated name for your release. So when you did an install, Helm created a release and saved it in your cluster. The name of this release is Old Fashioned Goat. You can totally override the random name generator, but I learn a lot of vocabulary from the random release <laughs> names, and they're just more fun, so I recommend them. You also have some metadata here. The next section is the resources section. These are the actual Kubernetes resources that got deployed in your cluster from your chart and their current status. And the last piece is the note section. This is like post installation instructions for your chart. So this is something that the chart author uh, defines and it gives you some steps to make sure everything's running fine and uh, kind of gives you guidance on what you can do next or what you might need to install next um, and how to play with your uh, chart installation. This is really nice to have. Let's drop down into our cluster and see what's going on there. So here I have a, a Redis pod and um, that's running. And we'll just describe that to make sure we have the, the right image. So we do that using the kubectl describe command. So if we scroll up here, we'll see that we're running Redis 3.2.8-R1 uh, from the Bitnami org, and everything seems to be fine. So no errors, we're good to go. Now we're gonna see what a Helm upgrade looks like or feels like. So let's upgrade to the latest version of Redis. If I do a Helm upgrade command and pass in the release name, which was Old Fashioned Goat. Old Fashioned Goat. Very distinguished. Love old fashioned goats. Um, okay, so we'll Helm upgrade and this release, and we'll do the stable ver Redis version that's at the latest version. So you don't actually have to pass in the version flag for this. You can just pass in the um, just stable Redis and it'll go to the latest. More stuff happened. So this is the same output. Every time you do an upgrade, you'll get this kind of output. And it's the same output that you'll get also in the Helm status command. You have metadata again, the resources that were deployed, and the notes section. Let's drop down and see what's going on in our cluster. So here we have a pod running. Let's make sure that the image that's running is something different than 3.2.8-R1. Describe command. Great, and now we have a Redis version at 3.2.9-R2. So it worked. Wonderful. And some other commands you can use are Helm list. Helm list lists the releases that you have. 
Uh, we can also delete old fashioned goat, but I hate to do that. So it's a good name. And if we do that and drop back down into our cluster, then we'll see that no resources are found. So we're good to go. So let's recap the basics. Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. A chart is a Kubernetes package. A release is an installation of a chart and its values in your Kubernetes cluster. And Helm is a little bit more than just a package manager because it also manages the life cycle of your application. And Helm is a good tool for operators to manage the life cycle of the application, but onboarding developers to Kubernetes is still really hard because you have to learn lots of things before you can even begin to be productive deploying applications on Kubernetes. Docker and Kubernetes concepts take some time to learn and master, and that's just the reality of it. Right, Gabe? That's right, and you know this is something we've been very passionate about, uh, you know, uh, since joining the Azure Container Service team. You know, during Michelle's keynote at this year's KubeCon in Berlin, she talked about who, how Kubernetes is still too hard to use for developers. And one example she gave is Ruby on Rails, the web framework which famously promises to help you build a blog in 15 minutes. As Michelle put it, we need Rails for Kubernetes. Absolutely. Yeah, and she's right. So, what might that look like? Well. I think it's uh, helpful to reflect on the software delivery process for modern container-based applications. So, you know, if you break this process down into three distinct steps, uh, you really have as the first step what I call code to commit, or what we at Microsoft call the inner loop. This is while developers are hacking on code, but before they commit and push that code to version control. The second step is commit to artifact. Now, for these modern applications, after developers push their code, typically a continuous integration system will pick up those changes, build container images, test them, and publish them to a container registry where the final artifacts are stored. Now, the last step is artifact to deployment. And as artifacts are updated in, in, in this way, they're continuously deployed out to staging and production environments with whatever human gating and testing is required between those environments. Now, when it comes to Docker and Kubernetes, many developers get tripped up right away during the inner loop uh, uh, process, you know, as Docker and Kubernetes concepts begin to enter the picture. Some common questions we hear when we're speaking with developers, um, Michelle and I can both relate to this, do I need Docker installed? How do I write a Docker file? How do I build a container image? Where do I push my image once I'm done? And on the Kubernetes front, how do I, you know, do I need Kubernetes installed? How do I write a Kubernetes manifest? How do I test my app to make sure it works inside of a running Kubernetes environment? Now, the answers are out there if you look hard enough, but what if developers didn't have to ask those questions at all? So, um, I'd like to introduce Draft from the Azure Containers team. Draft makes it really easy to build applications that run on Kubernetes. Draft targets this inner loop portion of the developer's workflow as they're hacking on code, but before that code is committed to version control. Let's go uh, take a look at what this looks like. So if we flip over to my laptop. So what I have here is a very simple um, application. And actually, um, you can see this is a very straightforward Python Flask application. And the idea is it's just going to print out hello draft when we're done. Um, but one of the things you'll note is you know, inside of this repo, and actually we can look at this inside of VS Code, You'll see that there is nothing here that is uh, specific to uh, you know Kubernetes. There's no Docker files. There's no Kubernetes manifest. There's no Helm charts. Nothing you know that would describe how to actually run this thing. So if you're a developer and, and you've been told by you know your your software team that you need to get this thing running inside Kubernetes, what do you do? Well, with Draft, it's as simple as this. Type in Draft Create. What Draft is going to do is it's going to actually detect what type of language you wrote inside of the, the source tree. And it's going to do some uh, interesting things like scaffolding out a Docker file, a Helm chart, and some configuration for the Draft binary. This effectively containerizes your application via scaffolding and writes it out into your source tree. So from this point, all you have to do as a developer is type in Draft up. 
And what DraftUp does is it will take your source code, ship it to the remote Kubernetes cluster, build everything in the remote cluster, you know, make sure every, everything is, uh, you know, all the images are available, and then take that Helm chart that's sort of the, the default values, uh, you know, for, for a, a Python application, get that running uh, via a Helm release uh, uh, inside the cluster, and then automatically expose it via something called Kubernetes Ingress, which is, uh, you know, you can see published at this URL here. We've got filled tiger. Uh, we happen to use the same name generator as, uh, <laughs> as they do in the Helm project. So now if I open up filled tiger, um, we can see hello draft is, is being promoted. Now, this is interesting. Okay, so we containerize the application. We got it working. But, you know, what if the application is not working right yet? Right? What if we're not done yet? Well, let's go make a change. So let's go into our Visual Studio uh, code editor here. And let's change this from hello draft to hello open dev. And I'll hit save. And the moment I hit save, what's going to happen is um, the draft uh, 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 command is going to be constantly looking for file changes um, on the, the local file system. And if, when it detects a change, it will automatically ship that change up to the cluster, rebuild all of the images, and push out an updated Helm release that will be available in seconds um, so that you can actually see what your changes look like live. You know, again, uh, keeping in mind that this is before you're ready to commit while you're still sort of hacking on the application. So if we go back to our browser and we hit refresh, we can see hello open dev. So you know this is making making it incredibly easy. As you can see, you know the developer didn't really have to understand anything about Docker or Kubernetes to get started. Um, and now when they're ready at this point, you know they can commit their changes, push them up to uh, source control, um, and 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 move on from there. So if we flip back to the slides. We can, uh, just for a recap on how draft works, so you can see, uh, you know, step one is draft create, which is going to uh, do the scaffolding, detect the application, write out the Docker file and necessary uh, uh, Helm charts and, and metadata into your repository. Step two is type in draft up to trigger this sort of inner loop watcher that is going to sort of monitor your IDE and you know, make sure that any changes are going to be automatically reflected in the Kubernetes runtime environment. And step three is do what developers do best. Hack away, get to work on your application, make sure that uh, you know, it's doing what you need it to do. And once you're done, you can commit those changes, push them up to source control where a continuous integration system can take over. So those are the three steps. Um, you know, uh, uh, draft. Uh, you know, again, making it incredibly easy uh, to get started with Kubernetes. Um, you know, we really want you to, to try this out on Azure Container Service, and um, we have a, a lot of great documentation online about how to set up Draft um, specifically for Azure with Azure Container Service, Azure Container Registry, um, and, and really get get going quickly. Yeah, and uh, if you'd like to get started and help us out and get hacking, then uh, those. Tools that we just showed, they're open source, so you're welcome to pick up an issue or submit an issue and uh, submit feedback. We very much welcome that. Great. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, attending today. This has been a, a wonderful event. Um, we, we look forward to working with you on open source in the future. Thanks, Thank you. Everyone. Please welcome Kaspar Zmitskevich, Senior Engineering Manager at Skype. Hi. So uh, I'm Kaspar. I'm from Skype Service Engineering. And uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, running Linux on Azure IaaS. So, but first, a little bit about me, our organization, and our relationship with Linux. So um, I'm from Core Services team in Skype. And we, as the name implies, run the core services of Skype. Uh, these are backend services, mostly written in C++, running on Debian Linux. Um, and as of three years ago, we do that on Azure IaaS as well. Our role as service engineering is constantly evolving. I'd say that we are <laughs> in a flux constantly. So we used to be a sort of like operations team. We involved into uh, service engineering. And now we are sort of moving towards being uh, site reliability engineers. So uh, <clears throat> that's like a lot of learning all the time, a lot of uh, improvements to ourselves and to our services. Now, Skype and Linux, well, um, it's been uh, going on for over a decade now. So Skype's been built on Linux, Skype's been always running on Linux, and Skype is still running on Linux, even though we are part of Microsoft. Um, once we got acquired by Microsoft, uh, technology stack didn't really change. In fact, we actually expanded into Microsoft's data centers, and we are still running Linux there as well. 
So currently, though, um, Skype consists of, let's say, hundreds of services. Some of them are microservices, some of them are like different types of services, like proprietary services. And it's sort of a split between Azure Pass and Linux. And if it's Linux, then it's either, either on Azure IaaS or in Skype data centers or in uh, Microsoft's uh, data center locations across the world. So what this talk will be about? Well, I'll hopefully uh, tell an interesting story about how we moved one of our first Linux-based services to Azure IaaS and some of the lessons I learned uh, as well as some of the practices uh, that we've adopted, uh, adopted since then. So, and this story is about relays. So there are different sort, uh, kinds of relays in Skype um, um, used for uh, video calls or audio calls or some, uh, some are used for uh, relaying some other types of uh, messages. But this is a story about uh, relays used for calling. Um, now, um, why are relays so important? Well, imagine if you have a, a bad internet connectivity and you are trying to call someone, then if there's a relay, you can actually relay your call over that and the chances of you getting decent sound quality increases. Uh, so from perspective of like uh, application, relays are just C++ applications running on Debian Linux, written by very, very clever uh, guys in media team in Skype and ran by the best service engineering team in Skype as well. So their workload on the relays is mostly bandwidth and CPU intensive. And this is important when we go to the uh, load testing of them. Uh, now, why did we choose to run relays in Azure IaaS? Well, there are several reasons. Um, the most important one uh, was that back in the day, in 2015, um, we were, the, the capacity for relays was not enough and the demand was growing quite rapidly. So uh, our relays have been running on bare metal servers for a while now, back then. So we had a choice. Uh, should we buy more metal, deploy it to data centers, or should we perhaps try something else? And at that time, uh, we already had several um, engineering teams uh, using Azure Pass. So we thought, well, why not to try uh, Azure IaaS then? So that's what we sort of did. And uh, like this is the story about that. Um, we had some concerns in the beginning. So to understand us uh, means that we were running uh, these uh, Linux servers on bare metal machines for years, for over a decade. So we were used to controlling the whole stack, the network, the server, the, the, everything else related to that. And so for us, the biggest concern was how will the relays work on a virtual machine? Because obviously that's pretty different from uh, running it on a server. So it didn't really have much to do with Azure as such, but mostly just running on a VM was a really big concern. Like, how many such VMs will we need? How will it scale? We are used to tuning the machines to perfection for maximum performance. So how will that work out? That was an interesting concern that we had. Now, one-to-one -one NAT is an important sort of uh, concern here as well. Uh, because, uh, again, since we're used to uh, running on machines on bare metal, we're also used to having direct connectivity to internet. And in Azure, this is not really possible. You have to go through the one-to-one -one NAT. So that was a concern. Um, stability, that's an important one uh, because there are two aspects to stability in our view. One is that how stable are the machines in terms of like, will they reboot or not? Like, will there, like what will be the stability like that? And another concern, the stability of performance. Just because today it works well doesn't mean that to do, tomorrow it's gonna work well. So that was kind of what we were worrying about a little bit. Now, uh, manageability. <laughs> well, if you have been managing machines on a scale of hundreds, or maybe up to a thousand, that's one thing. But once you start moving to virtual machines, well, we're talking about many, many hundreds or many thousands. So the question was, um, how do we deal with this? How do we, do we need to make any changes to our manageability tools? Or, or do we need to make changes to how we deploy and how we update these machines? So that was a, that was a biggie, I'd say. Uh, and lastly, monitoring. Well, again, everything, all the monitoring infrastructure is back in Skype DC. We have a couple of data centers uh, in Europe where we keep majority of our stuff deployed. And if we need to deploy to Azure, like how are we gonna connect Azure uh, with our monitoring infrastructure? Do we need to deploy new monitoring to Azure or, 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 or how do we solve this problem? So that's, uh, uh, that was a, a really interesting concern. So now before I go into relays, uh, uh, we need to touch on uh, one other interesting aspect of what we do in service engineering. Um, this will be the story about health check and why it's important. So if you have done anything uh, with an application or service that sits behind a load balancer, then you know that uh, load balancer is used to distribute the load from your clients across your uh, instances. 
But another important thing that the load balancer does is, of course, it will check on the instances that have failed and it will remove them from the load balancing pool. Now, this is all fine, but uh, in some cases, depending on what is your workload and what is your application, it could happen so that your application will only be removed from the load balancing pool once it's completely down. And of course, you don't want that because normally uh, every application has a uh, limit uh, at which uh, it stops performing as well. So sometimes it's referred to as the knee point of an application in scalability, which means that basically your application scales linearly up to a point and then it either flatlines or perhaps uh, the performance will actually decrease. So what we want to do at Skype is we want to catch uh, this uh, point. We want to make sure that we will offload our application before this point is reached, because otherwise we risk that the quality of the call uh, could suffer. So this is why in service engineering, uh, we have done a thing called health check. Health check actually looks at uh, different KPIs for the service, such as, I don't know, let's say the CPU load, the packet rate, stuff like that. But most importantly, it looks at latency because in performance, the most important thing of all is latency. And uh, we are specifically looking at UDP packet handling time latency. And we know at what, uh, let's say, threshold we need to offload the instance. So this all is important in the, in the story uh, later on. So, and the last thing about these uh, relays is uh, we use DNS-based load balancing, which means that when the client tries to find a relay, it will do a DNS query and it will be directed to the closest available healthy uh, relay. So that's the health check. And I think it's pretty important uh, in this story and actually in uh, service performance in general. Now, once we have decided that, all right, let's try to make relays work in Azure, uh, we had to do some load testing. Now, because we had the health check, it was actually pretty easy. Our job really was just to try different uh, SKUs on Azure and see uh, where will we get the best uh, uh, price performance um, uh, for them. And so we ended up actually choosing a standard D4 as our SKU, and we went on from there. Uh, we did some uh, experiments with production traffic for a while just to ensure that uh, the service runs stably enough. And uh, once we were happy, uh, we went actually further. Biggest question that we needed to, uh, I guess, answer uh, in this load testing phase will, how many such VMs will we need and in what regions? And uh, we ended up uh, coming uh, up with a number around 1K uh, distributed across uh, three regions. So the next important thing uh, when it comes to relays is the deployment model. And I would actually argue that this was the most, uh, let's say, interesting part of the whole uh, process of this whole first trial with the with our service in Azure IaaS, and uh, really, up until now, majority of our services that we do in Azure IaaS reuse the same model in one way or the other. So what is the deployment model? Well, it's basically just a concept of having separation between your production machines and management machines. So um, what this means is in every region where we deployed relays, we also deployed a separate network that contained management machines. Uh, management machines were um, distributed across uh, separate failure domains and update domains, and they were separated uh, with an ACL uh, from the actual production machines. Uh, then, once we knew that uh, this is the way how we want to go, we had a really interesting problem to solve. How do we do connectivity from Skype data center to Azure? Now, back then, there were several options in Azure, uh, several VPNs, uh, several types of VPNs that we could use, uh, but this all looked kind of complicated, and uh, we thought, what a why not to try something easier? So uh, we've been using uh, TLS tunnels uh, for many, many years. This is a very simple solution. And if you set up enough redundancy, it works fairly well. So as long as you don't need to shuffle back and forth large amounts of data, like, I mean, gigabytes and gigabytes uh, all over, then the TLS tunnels actually work really well. And so what we ended up doing is on every management machine, in every management network, we set up a TLS tunnel back to Skype DC. And we had two such tunnels per management machine because we have two main Skype data centers uh, in Europe. And then what are the roles of the management machine? Well, as you probably have guessed by now, we use it as a jump box to jump into production, but it's also used as a proxy. And proxy for uh, logs and telemetry um, because uh, all of our uh, centralized infrastructure is in Skype. We really need to uh, get that stuff uh, back there for aggregation and alerting. The uh, last thing we use uh, management machines for is app repository because we run on Debian Linux. It sort of makes sense to have app repos very close to actual production machines to enable really fast uh, deployments of uh, whatever we need to deploy there. So that's the deployment model. Uh, now comes the sort of 
interesting part and uh, part where I share a not so pretty graph, but it is real. It is real graph from production and it shows how we actually migrated our relays uh, from Microsoft data centers and Skype data centers to Azure IaaS. So once we knew uh, what the deployment model is going to look like, and once we knew uh, the results of the load testing and we knew how many VMs we need and in what regions we're going to deploy them, then it really was just a matter of doing the actual work and deploying them. Back then, we used Azure Classic as our tool for deployment because uh, ARM or our Azure uh, Resource Manager was lacking some of the features that we needed. So what this graph shows is that uh, around um, October 2015, uh, we started deployment of uh, uh, Azure uh, Relays and we did it in such a way that we still kept the uh, Skype DC servers running but in our DNS-based load balancer, we started adding Azure endpoints to it. And uh, you see there's a, like a drop and then a new spike. This, these are our experiments with uh, call quality. At that time, the demands for relays were growing rapidly, and we were experimenting to see uh, how much bandwidth can we actually afford to give uh, to each call. So there are some ongoing experiments there. Uh, once we were fairly satisfied uh, with the performance of Azure relays, uh, we started decreasing the percentage of traffic that is uh, sent uh, to uh, Skype DC, and so naturally, a majority of the traffic went to Azure. And as you can see, uh, the traffic stayed in Skype DC as well for a while. Uh, and there's an interesting reason for that is um, during the peak times, uh, we actually did not have enough capacity in Azure uh, to, um, to service all the traffic. And so since we had the health check, once the Azure machines got overloaded, the remaining traffic uh, was sent back to um, Skype DC. And uh, so we ran in such a hybrid setup for uh, quite some time, I would say some three, four months, before we started actually actively decommissioning the Skype DC servers and we switched to Azure uh, exclusively. So in the graph, um, we see that the light colors are Azure and the darker colors are actually Skype DC. So towards the end, it's all mostly in Azure. And then came our first problem. So um, we were so excited about Azure and uh, it all worked so well until this point when we realized that, well, even though it's mostly stable, there are reboots from time to time, like for whatever reason, maybe the hypervisor reboots, maybe Azure is doing some maintenance or whatever. And this wasn't so great for us uh, because relays are stateful, which means the clients who are connected to the relays, they expect that the relay is not going anywhere, <laughs> at least for a while, at least during the call, right? But sometimes it happens so that the relay actually disappeared. And what this means for a client is that client must very quickly reconnect to another relay. So this is done actually transparently. The client will not notice it, but what the client can notice is a short uh, decrease in call quality for the duration while the reconnection is happening. So obviously we had to fix this. And uh, what we came up with is, luckily, there was a service in Azure called uh, Azure Metadata Service, which is essentially uh, an endpoint that you can query, uh, even with curl, and what you can get from there is a bunch of information about your machine, like what region it's deployed, what's the size, and so on. But most important for us, you can get a flag which shows you that your machine is about to undergo maintenance. And uh, Azure sets this flag 10 to 15 minutes uh, before the reboot or maintenance is about to happen. What it allowed us to do is, now again, since we have the health check, right, then we were able to simply add an extra step into the health check so that health check script would not only query the status of the machine, the latency, but it would also query these endpoints and see if there is a flag set, the machine is about to be rebooted, then the machine is offloaded from our load balancer and the traffic is drained and no one ever actually knows that anything happened there. So that was a really nice solution and uh, we still use it till this day. And in fact, we use it with every other service that we do in Azure. Now the really sort of internal success story was India. So in 2015, uh, we were actively thinking about how to expand to India, because obviously we have uh, quite a lot of clients there. And unfortunately, until 2000, end of 2015, we had to send them to some more distant relays in, in, in other uh, regions. So as luck would have it, uh, in September 2015, Azure announced availability of India region, and we immediately knew that we must use it, like no other way, we must use it, like how, how, how do we do it, who do we need approvals from to get it done, and so on. So uh, in December, we had our first rel uh, relays running, and this was uh, not due to any technical uh, difficulties, this was mostly internal politics uh, uh, that uh, required us to do some 
approvals and so on uh, to get them set up. And really this was the, I'd say the beautiful part of this whole project because it was so easy to set them up. We already had the deployment model, we had the automation, we knew how many we're gonna need. So really it was just running a bunch of commands and, and that's it, we have India uh, up and running. Uh, once we were done with this project, uh, to give you some sense of scale, we had around uh, 1.2K VMs running on Linux uh, in eight different Azure regions and we were doing around 40 gigabits per second of traffic. So not too huge, but also not that small, I'd say. And that's the story about relays, and that's the story about how we moved the service from running on bare metal machines to running in Azure IaaS. Now, to give some sort of information about what we do currently with uh, Linux in Azure, I have some more slides for you. So, present day uh, Azure IaaS uh, at Skype. Well, like I said, we've been doing this for three years now, or a little bit more, and uh, we've moved some services in similar fashion as relays, but we also are doing some new ones in Azure. Uh, and uh, I must say that uh, we are quite happy, uh, both with the performance and stability and the features as well. Uh, I will be honest though, and there have been some issues with Azure. Uh, we've seen quite a few. Uh, most have been resolved and most have to do with either network or storage performance. And there are two reasons uh, why we see them. Uh, one of the reasons is that maybe sometimes something happens in Azure, some underlying uh, performance uh, bug or, or, or some uh, platform specific issue. And these are usually resolved fairly quickly. And then there are some more complicated ones. So Skype uh, workloads are rather uh, unorthodox sometimes. And the way how we use uh, TCP IP is a little bit different maybe how the usual microservices do it. So we've had some times where we hit some undocumented limits in Azure and then we simply see that, wow, I mean, this is a no-go. We cannot do this service in Azure because like it's just simply technically not possible. And luckily for us, uh, Azure has been uh, fairly uh, responsive and actually has uh, fixed these issues. So currently I can actually honestly report that uh, all the issues that we've had with Azure have been mitigated by now. Some of them are fixed completely, some of them are still being fixed. So the story here is that if you see a problem, you can actually report it to Azure support. They will actually fix it, but it might take a little bit of time and patience on your side. So that's really good. How do we deploy our services? This is sort of uh, learnings uh, uh, that we've had in the last three years. Well, nowadays ARM is the way to go. Really, you don't want to probably use Azure Classic. Uh, that's, it has several uh, limiting factors there and several things that you need to do manually. ARM is a rather uh, elegant solution. You simply describe how your environment is gonna look like and Azure actually takes care of everything. And the best part about deploying with ARM is the fact that you can uh, describe the amount of machines you need. And later on, if you need to add an extra 10, 20, 50, 100, you just change one integer, redeploy, that's it, it's done for you. So that's, that's really wonderful. Uh, we mostly use PowerShell to actually orchestrate the deployments, not because we have to, but simply because we're used to it. Um, and this works fairly well for us. But uh, lately we are actually big fans of Azure CLI 2.0. And why? Well, mostly because it's written in Python. And we in Skype are huge fans of Python. Uh, we write our scripts in Python. The health check is written in Python. So, um, and uh, why this uh, CLI 2.0 is good is um, you can actually import it as a Python module. And if you import it as a Python module, then you don't need to call any external commands from the shell. You simply call uh, functions. So, I mean, it doesn't get much more beautiful than that. Uh, we actually use a CLI 2.0 in one of the systems that we've built for automated image building. Because in this system, one of the steps is to deploy the image to Azure, to test that it boots, test that it works, and then report back the results. So, this is my attempt at uh, trying to show you the manageability design. Well, really, it's rather simple. Um, I thought of just having some text on the slides, but I thought maybe an image uh, uh, paints a better picture. The main point to see here is that really there are several uh, data centers that we have uh, in Skype and we simply connect them via redundant tunnels over the internet uh, to our management machines. And the important here uh, thing is that there are ACLs, both in front of management infrastructure and between your production and management layers. So like I said, this manageability uh, approach has been working really well for us. And this is something we are probably going to use uh, time and time again. Now, another important uh, learning in our sort of journey of Azure was building our own VM images. So 
If you are a fairly big organization, you have probably thought about it already or you are doing it already. And there are many good reasons for that. So one of the reasons is maybe that you want to pre-bake your application into the image. So for example, if you want to spin off, I don't know, let's say 100 new VMs, you simply spin them up using this, uh, this image and it's all going to work for you. Or maybe it's a compliance reason. Uh, for example, uh, in Skype Service Engineering, one of the things we are doing is uh, we are also ensuring that our operating systems are compliant with all the uh, requirements in Microsoft. And uh, it's very easy to do if you have built your own image. When we just started, we were using HashiCorp's Packer to build the images. And this worked uh, fairly well. It was easy to set up. Uh, but as time went by, we started using more and more Hyper-V in our own data centers. And we realized that we probably need a sort of uh, our own system to build the images. Uh, because we do a like, fair amount of customizations in our images. Uh, we have optional full disk encryption. Uh, we have uh, many other tweaks to the operating system and to the performance. So this system of building uh, our own images uh, was a decision we don't regret, and uh, it has uh, worked uh, wonders for us. One thing, for example, it allows you to do in general, if you have your own images, is if, of course, they are built nightly. Uh, if you want to spin up uh, new VMs, your normal cycle might be that you spin up the VMs, you, done all the, you do all the patching and updating, then you deploy your application, then you configure your application, then it registers with the load balancer and so on. If you have your own image, you spin it up, you query the meta information from metadata service, you discover where is the machine deployed, and that's pretty much it. The last step remaining is to register it with the load balancer. So really highly recommended to uh, cook your own images. Some other useful practices, well, perhaps worth mentioning, uh, Deprovision standby VMs. So, not sure how cool this sounds. Definitely not as cool as just using API to create new VMs, but actually rather practical. Uh, with some of the services, it's hard to predict how much capacity exactly do you need. And in sometimes uh, the provisioning steps still take minutes, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, and this might not be good enough for you. So, what Azure allows you to do, uh, allows you to do is it allows you to deprovision the VMs so you don't pay for the compute. Uh, and if you need to, you simply provision the VM back, and it's, uh, it's uh, up and running within minutes. So that's really good, and something that we use to ensure that there is some uh, buffer uh, of capacity uh, at any time. Obviously, take advantage of uh, uh, failure domains and update domains. Uh, no reason not to do it. Uh, we've been doing it for these last three years, and really, we haven't seen any problems. So long as you have your infrastructure uh, uh, split uh, across these uh, update domains and failure domains. Azure is fairly stable and really uh, no reason to worry about that. Sometimes machines go down and uh, there's not much you can do about that. And I don't know how your monitoring looks like, but uh, at some times we're not too proud about ours. And uh, in some cases, if a bunch of machines go down, then you can get uh, Lots of, like, a flood of alerts coming in, and uh, if this is, like, middle of the night, you are the on-call person, so you're probably not too happy about it. And the first order of business is to understand what is going on. And in order to do that, uh, we have a check for reboot velocity. What it basically means is simply we are checking the uptime of the machines, and the moment we detect that the uptime has massively decreased on a, on, on a, on a large amount of machines, we fire this alert off. Now, what this does is, really, it's really simple, but the on-call, when, when he or she wakes up, then they can immediately see, wow, the reboot velocity uh, alert has been triggered, so something is really wrong in Azure, so let's offload the whole region instead of trying to debug the problem, because it's probably not related to our application itself. Uh, luckily, we've only had situations like that a couple of times in the last three years, but it can happen, it probably will happen, this is inevitable, so you should prepare for that. Uh, detecting hypervisor change is uh, a little neat trick that we're doing, uh, you can easily do that on Azure VMs, and what it really gives you is, in case you notice any um, strange things in monitoring, let's say uh, some gaps or dips uh, in, in your graphs, then, and you don't see any like, explanation for that, if you have detected that the hypervisor has changed, then you can actually deduce that the Azure platform has migrated you from one hypervisor to another. So uh, it probably doesn't affect you too much, but it allows you to explain some uh, weird uh, things on the graphs. Metadata service, really, if this is the only thing you take from this presentation, start using metadata service. It's really a life changer, and especially nowadays when they're adding more features uh, that allow you to detect in which region you are deployed to, then this is really valuable. Now, I must say that for the actual uh, orchestration of applications and for deploying the actual software, we do use Ansible heavily. 
We've used it uh, since forever, basically, and we keep using it in Azure as well. The beautiful part about using Ansible is that regardless if this is a new location where you're deploying to, or uh, if it's an existing one, you have the same playbooks, the same roles, you simply run Ansible, and it does everything for you. It does not depend on any management infrastructure or anything else for that matter. So, uh, a really valuable tool for that. A local firewall is a good thing to have as well. In Azure, at this moment, unfortunately, there is no way to ensure that the ACLs that are defined are actually there. So, probably and hopefully, it's there, but hope is sort of not a strategy. So, the best thing to do is to apply local firewall as well, and then you have the peace of mind that, uh, that, you, that only the services that you expect to be running uh, on the internet are available on the internet. Lastly, resource locks. So, I'm pretty sure that uh, most people have heard about these tragic moments in developer or engineer uh, lives when they are doing a deployment to QA or test, uh, to do, I don't know, some smoke tests or whatever, and they realize that, hey, they are deploying to production instead. And during this deployment, they wipe out all of production. So we, <laughs> luckily, uh, as far as I know, haven't had such issue issues in Skype yet. Uh, but um, anyways, it's always better to learn from somebody else's mistakes. And in order to avoid this, it's very easy. Uh, you set resource locks in Azure. So any resource group uh, can have a lock. Uh, the lock can be either lock that prevents you from deletion, uh, or uh, it can be a read-only lock, which means that like uh, you can still do this, but first you'll have to remove the lock. And what we do is everything is automated except the removal of the lock. So if anyone runs the automation, it will fail. And the removal of the lock is a separate uh, step. So that's sort of uh, it for the best practices. Uh, last thing to note here is Azure really is growing fast. And in the last three years, we've seen plenty of new regions added. Uh, we've seen new uh, V2 machines. And the V2 machines, again, if you're not using them yet, start using them. They're actually faster and cheaper than the previous ones. And um, I guess uh, one last uh, bit of advice, uh, the GitHub account of Azure uh, and all of Microsoft is actually a really good place to see what's going on. Uh, we have had several cases uh, during uh, developing of our ARM scripts for automation that we see, hmm, where is this error com uh, coming from? And we go on the GitHub and we see, all right, there's an issue already. Perhaps we can add some more detail to this issue or pe perhaps we can simply learn from it. Uh, either way, it's a really good thing to uh, check and uh, I guess be tracking. So that's all from me. Um, I'm Kaspar from Skype. If you have any questions, we'll have someone uh, who can answer them as well. So thank you. Welcome back, John Gossman. We're now close to the end of the show. Today, we've had a great agenda covering some of the most exciting open source innovations happening in the cloud. At Microsoft, we understand the role that open source has for developers and organizations who are transforming in the cloud. And it's exciting to share that commitment with you all today in events like this. I'd like to thank all of our partners and all of our speakers for engaging in the conversation today at Azure OpenDev. Now, if you haven't already checked out azure.com slash opendev, please take a look now. We've added some great content that'll help you get started using Node and Java applications in Azure. We look forward to the next edition of OpenDev. And if you are too, don't forget to sign up at azure.com slash opendev so that you can be in the know. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>